for phase one, sorry. Pleasant good morning, everyone. And thank you for joining us. Good morning, good afternoon, good evening, depending on where you may be. And thank you for joining us for this very important webinar on decarbonization in the shipping and port industry. So we just have some brief housekeeping um, this morning as we do have it set up in webinar mode. Um, what I would like to point out at this time though is those of you who are Spanish speaking, you do have the translation or the interpretation tab below where you can switch over to the translation from English to Spanish. So I will advise you, encourage you to do so now so you could hear the rest of the um, housekeeping um, um, before we, as we start the webinar. Okay, so you are allowed or able to um, ask your questions in the question, using the question and answer tab that you will see to the bottom or to the top of the screen, depending on where you have your Zoom controls, um, to ask questions or answers during the proceedings this morning. When we open up for panel discussion, we will encourage you to use the hand, um, the raise hand function. We will be able to see you and um, encourage you to ask your questions. So it is my pleasure this morning now to introduce the coordinator of this morning's webinar, Mr. Adrian Bihari. Mr. Adrian Mihari is an assistant professor of practice at the Maritime Studies and the Center for Maritime and, and Ocean Studies at the University of Trinidad and Tobago Maritime Campus. Here he lectures in Maritime Economics and Logistics, and Adrian has a bachelor's degree in Economics from the University of Trinidad and Tobago and a master's degree in General Maritime Administration from the World Maritime University in Sweden. He has vast experience in port planning and management of port operations at the Port of Trinidad and Tobago. He also worked at the petroleum sector and the yachting and marina ship repair sector. And he's currently serving his fourth term as the Deputy Chairman of the Port Authority of Trinidad and Tobago. He's a charter director certified by the Caribbean Governance Training Institute, and he's also certified in public procurement by the Caribbean Procurement Institute. And Mr. Bihari is a member of the International Association of Maritime Economics. In 2010, he was appointed chairman of the Regional Tax Force, appointed by CARICOM Secretariat to consider the feasibility of establishing a regional fast ferry service in the Carib Southern Caribbean. And the final report of this task force was presented and approved at the meeting of the Council for Trade and Economics um, Development in May 2021. He, had, he was contracted in 2007 by the Ministry of Works as a sector specialist to plan the development of the water taxi ferry service project which involved the development of terminal um, infrastructure and the procurement of four new fast ferries based on the design and bill method. And the service was implemented in 2010 and is now an integral part of the national transportation system. So Mr. Bihari is one of the most experienced, I will say, maritime practitioners in Trinidad and Tobago, and we could even push it as far as the Caribbean. So Adrian, I welcome you, good morning. 
Thank you, Stefan. Um, do I share screen or no? You, you could go ahead. We can okay. see you. Yeah. You can see me. All right, that's great. Okay. Thank you, Stefan, for that um, very uh, extensive introduction. Um, I will return the favor at this stage so that we get the introductions out of the way for both the host of the webinar, yourself, and uh, myself as the coordinator of the webinar. So let me quickly introduce our host, uh, who is Chief Cook and bottle washer for today's webinar, uh, Mr. Stefan Nana. Stefan is a senior instructor at the University of Trinidad and Tobago, and he holds 21 years of combined teaching and research experience at the University of Trinidad and Tobago, and also the University of the West Indies. He has a BSc in physics with a minor in environmental physics and material science, and he progressed to complete a master of science in environmental science and management um, subsequently. His key focus is greenhouse gas emissions, reduction from all modes of transportation, but he also has an interest in renewable energies. He is the MTCC Caribbean Greenhouse Gas Advisor at the Center for Maritime and Ocean Studies, and he is certified by the UNFCCC Secretariat and the Greenhouse Gas Management Institute GHGMI, uh, to verify his exp expertise in the IPCC guidelines and in enhancing the skills to respond to the requirements emerging from the implementation of the Paris Agreement. So uh, Stefan is one of our uh, principal um, uh, employees involved in the MTCC project, uh, the technical cooperation unit that is one of five uh, headquartered in the um, in the world, and I would invite Stefan at this stage, while we await the attendance of the chairman of the UTG, I would invite Stefan to talk a little bit more about the work of the Center for Maritime and Ocean Studies, and, partic and in particular the MTCC and its involvement in this very ambitious um, objective of sustainable development. Thank you very much, Adrian. So. Um, in addition to, um, well, the, the seminars and the webinars that we do put on for awareness, which is part of the capacity building initiatives of the university. And the, as Adrian mentioned, the, Univ the MTCC Caribbean, which is the Maritime Technology Cooperation Center of the Caribbean, um, is one of five centers of it um, that the IMO has established within its Global Maritime Technology Cooperation Center. So we are proudly hosted within UTT and it was a, we were established in 2008, so 2018, sorry. So we are, we have um, had about five to six years experience within um, capacity building and transfer of technology within the Caribbean region. Um, so, and we were one of five, so we are in the Caribbean, the others are within Latin America, Africa, um, Asia, right, and the Pacific. Um, during this morning, we will put a link in the chat that could take you to the MTCC website where we have publications on the work, the ongoing work that we have done. Um, over the past five years. So we have implemented a number of projects, um, pilot projects and webinars that I do believe I recognize some names here that will have attended some of these webinars. So we have been heavily involved in um, initiatives to decarbonize the maritime sector to reduce the emissions associated with shipping within the industry. And we have a number of esteemed um, presenters this morning who will give us a greater insight into the, the sector. And um, all of this morning deals um, with port emissions, um, which is responsible for approximately 5% of the emissions um, of the sector. Um, so 
the MTCC we have looked at, we have been involved in a number of projects which are both shore based and um, ocean going for the ocean going vessels. Um, the university have also undertaken a number of um, projects um, to carry out inventories on the um, greenhouse gas emissions associated with some of the port or the major port operations within Trinidad and Tobago. And this, this is an ongoing exercise. Um, so we, we should look forward to some of these publications also soon. All right, so um, that's some of the key points on the work that we have done within the MTCC over the past couple of years, right? And we know, well, within the Caribbean region, um, greenhouse gas emissions associated with the transportation sector on the whole is only secondary to um, emissions associated with power generation. So it is a priority sector within the Caribbean region where there is scope to reduce the emissions. And as you know, we have a number of ports, major ports within the Caribbean, right? We also have a number of major um, shipping registries within the Caribbean region also. So all of these initiatives that are being introduced by the IMO um, and um, other jurisdictions uh, around the world will have some kind of impact associated with it on the Caribbean, right? And these initiatives would most likely, some of these initiatives are those that we will have to implement or be able to support in the very near the coming future, right? So that is a capstone basically on some of the work that is currently being done within the sector um, on the MTCC side and within Trent and on the University of Trent Tobago side um, on emission reductions within it. And as some of you may know, there is the, the IMO um, initial greenhouse strategy, which has been revised recently also, which is calling for a reduction in emissions um, of 50% by 2040 and to allow these emissions to peak as soon as possible and um, to be near zero or zero by the year of 20, um, 2050. So it, the, the sector does have quite a way um, to go in order to achieve those goals or those targets. And all the players within the sector has a role to play um, to help meet those objectives. Uh, Stefan, thank you very much for that uh, brief introduction into the work of the uh, Center for Maritime and Ocean Studies as it relates to the MCCC. Could you also, would you also want to expand a little bit on the work of the University of Trinidad and Tobago at the wider level in terms of the non-governmental organization that the chairman has created uh, for alternative renewable energy and some of the projects that are being pursued by other campuses at the University of Trinidad and Tobago? in relation to uh, memorandum of agreements that we have signed with other organizations such as the NEC and um, also um, process engineering and their role in terms of um, entering into MOAs uh, for uh, alternative renewable energy projects, the solar energy projects and so on. Yeah, so we have a number of renewable energy projects ongoing within the university, the, the Center for Energy. and. Um, as a matter of fact, some of them are related to port, um, port emissions reductions. So there's one particular one that is currently ongoing, right, where we should see a rollout of renewable energy systems um, on, on and being implemented at the port. And um, all of these tend to be interrelated, again, as, as it is process engineering, um, center for energy, and so on. And um, UTT has been actively um, pursuing projects in transportation, right, to reduce the emissions associated with it. So we have a number of research projects and PhD students, MSCs, MPhil students that are currently um, undertaking um, their degrees in renewable energy systems. Um, we are currently um, 
in the process of creating a renewable energy group, right? And that is a joint group between some of the lecturers and the practitioners of UWI and UTT, right? Under the stewardship of um, the chairman of the University of Trinidad and Tobago. So that is also something that we could look forward to um, in the near future, the establishment of that renewable energy um, group. Um, uh, who's, who will, all of the terms of reference are completed and they're in the process of being adopted and so on. Um, those, the, that group has specific uh, mandate to introduce the renewable energy systems and make an awareness um, to Trinidad and Tobago. And we're looking at all sectors, not just um, transportation, energy, right? We are looking at all sectors associated with that group. I can also state briefly, Stefan, that the president of the University of Trinidad and Tobago, himself, Professor Prakash Prasad, has been pursuing a number of memoranda of agreements uh, with various organizations and institutions in pursuit of um, decarbonization in the transportation sector. Um, and as well as alternative renewable energy. So um, all of this is to say that the university is very focused on this important topic of decarbonization and um, the use of alternative renewable energy, sustainable sources of energy. Uh, I myself have done uh, one study on behalf of ECLAC, uh, which uh, examined um, energy consumption and energy efficiency uh, at the container terminal at the Port Authority train at Tobago. Uh, and it was based on survey data collected uh, by the Port Authority uh, that was based on a template prepared by uh, one of our uh, panelists here today, um, Professor Gordon Wims Meyer, uh, when he worked at ECLAC uh, at the Chilean office. Um, I also presented in March of last year um, a review of alternative renewable energy projects being undertaken um, um, in Caribbean countries. Um, and the findings were that uh, the projects that were being undertaken uh, within the Caribbean were few and far uh, in between. And um, they lacked a lot of international financial support in order to get a lot of these projects off the ground. So this is something I'm, no, I'm quite sure Gordon and others will touch on, maybe Dominic as well, uh, when he talks about carbon pricing. Now, we had been uh, waiting on Professor uh, Imbe, the chairman of the EGT, uh, to deliver the opening uh, remarks. He's a bit delayed, um, but when he gets uh, here, he will certainly uh, fall into the program and deliver uh, his remarks, um, at which time I will introduce him formally uh, to the um, webinar. Uh, without Losing any momentum, let me begin today's proceedings by inviting Dr. Anas Alamush uh, to make the first uh, presentation. Um, Dr. Anas Alamush works as a postdoctoral research associate at the World Maritime University in Malmo, Sweden. Um, I, as you heard, uh, I am a, a, an, an alumni of that uh, university. Um, it's my alma mater. Um, I went to that university many, many years ago in 1985-86. I'm one of the, the first generation of the Starship Enterprise that would have entered that institution. Anas embarked on his academic journey after serving as a ship's captain in the Jordan Navy. And Anas has a Master of Science degree in Shipping Management and Logistics. And he has a PhD in Maritime Energy Management Port decarbonization from the World Maritime University. As a proud alumnus of the World Maritime University, Sasakawa and the UN Nippon Research Program on the Law of the Sea, Anas has focused on developing sustainable frameworks for the Port of Aqaba in Jordan. Um, Anas' drive for excellence extends beyond his academic pursuits. He actively participated in high-level projects, collaborating with industry professionals, such as EU Bonus, Baltimari, which focuses on enhancing maritime safety, and the WMU ITF Future of Work project, which explored the integration of cutting-edge technologies in the shipping industry. 
ANA still plays a pivotal role in the EU Horizon Sea Energy Project, which is dedicated to facilitating the transition of ports towards the use of cleaner energy sources, reinforcing his commitment to sustainable port operations. Currently, ANAS works at the World Maritime University on IMO, uh, International Maritime Organization, impact assessment of the greenhouse gas medium-term measures. Demonstrating his aptitude for research, ANAS has published numerous studies in internationally renowned and peer-reviewed journals. Uh, furthermore, ANAS has leveraged his expertise by serving as a reviewer for uh, internationally peer-reviewed maritime transport and sustainability journals. Beyond academia, ANAS has engaged with diverse nations, fostering international partnerships and contributing to the development of comprehensive transport strategies. ANAS's accomplishments have not gone unnoticed as he has been honored with prestigious accolades, including the Queen of Denmark, Marguerite, a second medal for his outstanding service in the realm of international affairs. Um, the host of today's webinar uh, will post to the chat um, the link to Anas's most recent uh, peer-reviewed journal article uh, for the benefit of those in attendance, which you can download uh, to your hard drive and read um, uh, and include in your reading list. So without further ado, let me uh, introduce Anas Alamush uh, as our first presenter uh, for today's webinar. Um Good morning. Good morning. Oh, okay, hold on. Adrian. Hold on a second. Uh, we now have uh, our esteemed chairman of the University of Trinidad and Tobago. Uh, let me quickly uh, read uh, Professor Imbe's uh, bio notes and allow him to deliver the opening remarks. He has been a bit delayed this morning by some other um, matters. Professor Claman A.C. Imbe is a university professor in the field of mechanical, metallurgical, uh, manufacturing engineering at the University of the West Indies, UE, St. Augustine. He is a fellow at the, of the Association of Professional Engineers of Trinidad and Tobago, APEP, and a registered engineer at the Board of Engineering of Trinidad and Tobago, a fellow of the American Society of Mechanical Engineers, and a member of the American Society for Materials International. Professor Imbe graduated with a BSc in Mechanical Engineering with an honors degree from the University of West Indies and went on to study for the Master of Science degree in Metallurgical Quality Control at Brunel University, London, UK. He also completed his PhD in Mechanical Metallurgical Engineering from UE and in collaboration with Concordia and McGill Universities in Canada. I think he told me that he obtained his pilot license while he was out there. <laughs> um, <laughs> Professor Imbe has taught at both the undergraduate and postgraduate levels and has over 192 publications and presentation comprising uh, refereed journals, local and international conferences and seminars, technical reports, as well as books, reports, and proceedings. He has further supervised scores of undergraduate capstone projects, several international exchange students, and over 30 postgraduate theses. He has held several academic administrative positions and board appointments, along with serving as an industry consultant to various organizations. Professor Imbe is the recipient of numerous prestigious awards including the Shaconia Medal Goal, the Order of Trinidad and Tobago, which was uh, quite recently presented to Professor Imbe, uh, which is the highest national award uh, in the Republic of Trinidad and Tobago, the Vice Chancellor's Award for Excellence in Public Service, uh, which is the UE's highest award, the Career of Excellence in Engineering, which is APET's highest award, and Nehurst's Gold Award for Excellence in Science and Technology. Let me just add to this by a note by stating, Professor Imber is one of the uh, pioneers uh, of metallurgical uh, manufacturing of the national instrument, the steel pan. And uh, if I listened to an interview and got him quite um, correct, uh, he is promising to go further with a new version of the steel pan, 
um, in in the near future. Did I get did I get that news interview correct, Professor? Yes, sir. Very good. So we look forward to that uh, further innovation of the steel pan, which is the most recent musical instrument in the uh, well 20th century. Now, uh, without further ado, let me turn over uh, to Professor Imbe for him to deliver today's opening remarks. Yeah, good day and welcome to our virtual audience, wherever you are, to this most important topic of decarbonization in the shipping and port industry. Please allow me to congratulate Mr. Adrian Behari, Assistant Professor in Practice, Center for Maritime and Ocean Studies at the University of Trinidad and Tobago, for once again, organizing an international webinar on a topic of global significance. Professor Bihari has been able to assemble a high level group of experts in the persons of Dr. Anas Alamush, Research Associate of the World Maritime University, Dr. Jan Hoffman, Head of Logistics of the United Nations Conference on Trade and Development, UNCTAD, Dr. Dominic Englert, Senior Economist of the World Bank's Global Transport Practice, and Professor Gordon Wilsmeyer, Logistics Professor and Chair of the of La Universidad de los Andes, Colombia. Professor Bihari has been able, ably assisted in this venture by Mr. Stephen Stefan uh, Nanan, Senior Instructor, Center for Maritime and Ocean Studies at UDT, and GHG Advisor to the MTCC Caribbean. Let me just explain what the MTCC Caribbean is, although many of you uh, probably know what the MTCC is. The MCC, MTCC Caribbean, sorry, is hosted by the University of Trinidad and Tobago. It's one of five maritime technology cooperation centers, MTCCs, in the world. MTCs are charged with capacity building and climate mitigation in the maritime shipping industry. And it is a joint project of the IMO and the European Union, funded by the European Union aimed at reducing greenhouse gas and other emissions, as well as promoting energy efficiency in the maritime shipping industry. This webinar is very much in line with the objectives of the MTCC. A recent World Bank report states that international shipping accounts for the movement of more than 70% of the value and 80% by volume of global goods traded. Because international shipping is done mostly in large containers and other bulk mechanisms, the industry only accounts for about 3% of global greenhouse gas emissions. Comparative with much less uh, than other means of transportation. However, the industry as all others must play its part in the global green energy agenda. This agenda was set as net zero by 2050, but recent events suggest that the timeline, that this timeline generally must be shortened significantly. Decarbonization in the shipping industry will require trillions of dollars in investment, including maritime infrastructure such as ports, which can also help lower the cost of goods. And that is very important for the consumer. In order to achieve this greening of the shipping industry, the International uh, Maritime Organization has suggested technologies and other measures to make these changes cost-effective and equitable for different countries. And that's very important. Many countries cannot afford to spend the kind of money that is required to green the, the, the shipping industry. A price on carbon emissions is one such measure, which can also generate revenue of the order of 50 billion annually between 2025 and 2050. Small island developing states and least developing countries are most at risk from climate change, to which causes they have contributed much less. And these countries should benefit from a dedicated portion of carbon revenues as recommended in a report on distributing carbon revenues from shipping. This is a recent report. There is a big gap between the climate finance provided and the estimated climate needs of those countries, that is small island developing states and least developing countries. 
To repeat, they are most affected by climate change, but they have contributed much less over the years. Also, the most vulnerable countries struggle to access climate finance due to lack of capacity. So capacity building is a very important measure in this venture. Despite these constraints and its small size, Trinidad and Tobago has to play its part in this global mission and has embarked on an ambitious project on carbon capture and storage funded by the country's government and some major oil and gas companies such as BP and Shell. In the interim, they have to find a way that is in the interim of the continued use of oil and gas, particularly oil. We have to find a way to capture greenhouse gases from shipping. The importance of capturing the gas so that it is not released in the atmosphere is extremely important, particularly as we continue to use over 80% of fossil fuels for our energy requirements in the world. This webinar would contribute to keep the University of Trinidad and Tobago in the eyes of the public, and especially in the international shipping industry, as a serious contributor to research and education in the area of decarbonization and other important areas. Again, Professor Adrian Bihari was congratulated for its continuing efforts in this regard. And I wish to also thank the distinguished international speakers who have agreed to be part of this exercise at relatively short notice. I wish you all success in this webinar. Thank you. Thank you very much, Professor Clement Imbeer, uh, for that uh, very informative uh, presentation, clearly the subject of some research into the area of decarbonization. I'm therefore going to amend the number of presenters to include Professor Imbeer's uh, presentation as well, and maybe invite him to join the panel discussion. I know he's an expert in this area, and I know he's a source of inspiration and support and guidance to to most of us or all of us who seek out his uh, advice on various areas. Uh, without further ado, uh, let me introduce Anas Alamush. Anas, you are uh, one of the rising stars uh, in the area of decarbonization. So we are all eager and keen to hear what your research is revealing um, from your various publications and presentations today. I thank you and give you the floor. Uh, thank, thank you very much, uh, Professor Adrian, and I'll also uh, thank uh, Stephen and uh, Professor Embry, and also the panelists, uh, Professor Jan, uh, uh, Dominique, and uh, Gordon. It is a pleasure and honor for me to be present here today and uh, to share with you some of uh, our research findings. And one of the main findings uh, to uh, facilitate uh, decarbonization is uh, awareness raising and sharing information. So thanks to you for doing this today for all this uh, public. Uh, and allow me now to start with my presentation. Anas, have you shared screen? Right. You can see my screen now? Yes, very good. So I, I will be talking about the port decarbonization. Port decarbonization, similar to shipping decarbonization, it's a very huge topic, but I will be gathering some pieces of the logos of decarbonization, sharing some of our findings from the projects that we worked on and from the publications. So the agenda for today is, uh, we, I will talk about some facts, uh, motivation, why ports need to do decarbonization, some of the technologies to help the port decarbonizations, and what are the barriers to decarbonization, uh, some of the implementation tools, uh, policy and management tools to uh, help mitigate the barriers and also uh, uh, imp uh, implement properly decarbonization. Uh, introduce the port decarbonization and energy transition stakeholders. Uh, last but not least, opportunities for developing countries and a case study showing how we did some search about one port decarbonization. We know all the, that the uh, climate change impacts are intensifying uh, through floods and hurricanes and droughts, and this is mainly for the precursor GHG emissions. 
uh, there is a huge concern from the whole uh, world about the, this high emission and the entire logistic chains uh, are under pressure to reduce uh, its carbon emissions. There is also uh, uh, international uh, trade uh, port trade, uh, 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 growth in the international trade. This means more activities in port and also future uh, uh, high emissions. Ports also visit, visible and accountable to decarbonize themselves and the, the logistic change. We can see that we are start, now start facing the climate change and it is the reality through the floods, through the hurricanes and fires. And we as ports are uh, 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 obliged to, to, to do something uh, in, uh, for decarbonization in line for the Paris Agreement goals and the United Nations Sustainable Development Goals. We have thousands of ports uh, uh, all around the world, and we have also the sh ships, ships made thousands, millions of port calls every year. And we can see that ports are also energy intensive and high emitters because they are centric of uh, industrial emissions through refineries, power plants, tenants, and the logistic chains. Uh, uh, the, 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 the port em themselves, as can be seen on the right uh, uh, hand side of the, the table, emissions are high. Uh, they, those are examples of the uh, some uh, emission inventories from all or around the world. Unfortunately, there is not one uh, source showing the whole port emission in, uh, uh, emission inventory, but it is separate separate and dispersed inventories showing how much port emissions are high. Uh, shipping emit three percent of the world emissions, and around five percent of shipping emissions are expected to be in the port. Uh, which account sometimes to 50% uh, uh, of port emissions. And some studies stated they account five times, which is a huge emission in the, in the port itself. We don't forget also land transport emission in the port. Some studies uh, highlighted that it could reach double the amount of port emissions in the port area. Why ports need to decarbonize themselves? This is regulation compliance, uh, security and pressure from the logistic chains, shippers, consignees, carriers, forwarders, pursuit of greening their image and better market position. This is part of their corporate social responsibility. And there is also co-benefit with the reduction of ambient air pollutants, uh, decarbonization and the associated energy transition, mitigate energy sources scarcity, improve the energy security, especially volatility in the prices and supply, and also bring about economic benefits through the energy efficiency. Last but not least, it also contributes to the implementation of the United Nations Sustainable Development Goal. We have, when we talk about the port uh, uh, CO2 emission, we talk uh, we, 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 we consider three, three scopes. The first scope is the direct emission by port owned fleet vehicles, buildings, uh, stationary sources, uh, and typically those are equipments owned by the port authorities. Scope two is the indirect through uh, purchased electricity. And scope three is the port tenants and other emission sources including uh, logistics chains such as ships, trucks, railways, uh, 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 marine services, especially if they are private. Uh, we define, there is no definition for web decarbonization except aligning it with the, 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 the uh, Paris Agreement. We provided a, a tentative uh, definition, which is the utilization of mitigation measures, technical and operation emission reduction measures, to reduce, neutralize, and offset CO2 from various port emission sources, uh, port operation, ships, and land transport, while the surplus CO2 emissions should be offset by sink or sinks or sequestration. That is to reach net zero emission by 2050 in line of the Article 2 of Paris Agreement. We did a one study that put together all the, the technical and operational measures to reduce the port emissions. And those uh, divided into uh, those emissions, those technologies that reduce and help to a certain extent decarbonize the port operation, changing equipments, changing the uh, energy sources by alternative fuels, renewable energy uh, utilization, energy efficiency, digitalization, and other operational measures. When it comes also to, to, to ships, ports play a role in facilitating decarbonization of shippings especially by, uh, uh, by provision of alternative uh, uh, fuel bunkerings, alternative fuels, 
and engaging in the in the green shipping corridors. Uh, there are other uh, also measures to reduce the the the, the ship's emission. Uh, we all know about it, like cold ironing, etc. Port also can play a role dependent on their business model and their outreach and the scope of their uh, uh, outreach. Uh, they can also reduce the land transport emission, uh, trucks emission through banning of all the trucks, such as uh, the, those done in USA, mod, uh, participating in the model split, and also reducing the truck emission uh, congestion reduction. Renewable energy also can be used highly in port, especially wind energy and solar energy, and we see high potential, especially in those countries that are able to, 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 to exploit the, the, the renewable energy. We worked in a, a, a Synergy a project, which is a EU Horizon project, as uh, addressing the ports as energy hub. And we built here, as you can see here, a, a, a framework, port as green uh, fuel and renewable energy hubs. Uh, the idea is to, to study how ports can become energy hubs by uh, 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 producing the fuels or at least using third party to provide the fuel, alternative fuel for the shipping, also using re uh, renewable energy. And this uh, should be supplied not only for shipping, but including the city itself. So, so the, the, we, we, are, we are addressing how ports become a, a hub between the city and the logistics chains. Of course, while taking opportunity to reduce their emissions. Now we talked about the technology. The, the technology is there, but what are what what are the reasons that binding ports back from really decarbonization themselves? As we can see, once we do any inventory, the emissions of ports are still high. One of the main barriers is the lack of capital finance, including other hidden costs of technologies, uncertainty about the future regulations. Some ports are not following any regulation or the port authorities cannot enact the any regional or uh, uh, national regulations, different port business models and management. So this is complex institu institutional nature. There is lack of awareness, information and culture, uh, training and managing experience. Once we ask ports uh, to, uh, in our surveys, they, 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 are, they are not aware about the port decarbonization, not even environmental pollution. Technical issues in technology, suitability and abatement potential of the technology, safety and security, especially now we are talking about ammonia, toxic, uh, uh, hydrogen, etc. Complicity in the implementation of the measures, uh, lack of governmental support, and there is managerial inertia. I come from area where there are, uh, they are good in economics and we are all oil producing countries, but the ports are not decarbonized. They, they, we, we, we relay this to, to, to justify this as there is managerial inertia because decarbonization is a new idea. Recently, we, we did uh, uh, consolidate the port decarbonization implementations in terms of the uh, pathways, barriers, uh, suggested some solutions, and also explained what are the opportunities arising from port decarbonization. In another study also, we addressed how port can implement the technologies, the measures that we already mentioned, and how can they also mitigate those barriers? The first and the backstop for all the, 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 the implementation is enacting regulations, engaging in the incentives and uh, grants, uh, tariff change to, so for the polluters, uh, engaging in market-based measures, similar to the market-based measures uh, uh, initiated by IMO or the EU, but in, a, in the port scale against the port polluters, uh, port uh, operators, tenants, uh, land transport, voluntary agreement, and I, I, I heard also I heard uh, earlier that some of the voluntary agreements signed uh, between the UDT and other industrial associations, uh, concession analysis requirements. So we recommend here that uh, in any concession analysis con 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 requirements, terms should be included. Uh, regarding the port decarbonization. And if those concessions has, has already been uh, uh, implemented, then discussion voluntarily to reduce their emissions. Of course, capacity building, uh, training programs and awareness raising helps, uh, knowledge sharing and support, how to do inventory, how the MTCCs are example of this, 
uh, putting the, uh, the, the port decarbonization in strategic plans also is very important. This is also a specific study about the implementation of schemes of port decarbonization. To continue the, 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 the ways of implementation uh, uh, in terms of policy and management tools, ports also needs to invest and uh, uh, the investment and finance pool from uh, all in the industries, uh, develop their man management, cooperation, collaboration, and coordination uh, between uh, intra ports, inter ports, and even regional ports. They, they should also first thing do uh, inventory and monitoring so they know what is the, the, the level of their carbon emission and then conduct feasibility studies, uh, safety guidelines for the uh, alternative fuels, certification and edits, stakeholder mapping and management. And we also here highlight that we need new business models such, such are third party investments and the fuel supplier guarantee for the, 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 the green shipping corridors. Talking about uh, the importance of the stakeholders in port decarbonization, uh, one of the issues highlighted by EU and they needed some solution uh, for it is the, 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 the energy of the stakeholders because some of the um, technologies are not port specific. Many stakeholders are engaged with it. So uh, the synergy uh, project that I work on uh, address this uh, by uh, studying the what are those stakeholders and showing ways for ports to manage stakeholders. And we suggested the stakeholder circle methodology by uh, showing them how to identify the, the, the stakeholders, how to prioritize them, how to visualize, engage, and monitor them. This work also done in consultation with the 12 partners in the, 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 the synergy projects and also validated by uh, some experts in the field. Uh, and we, we define the uh, stakeholders of the port energy transition as individuals, uh, groups, and even organizations who have interest, rights, and ownership over the energy transition. So those stakeholders may contribute to or be affected by the energy transition work and outcome, taking into consideration that these stakeholders may accelerate or decelerate the energy transition and thus influence the outcome. Some of the neighboring ports decided to start handling the, the, the ammonia and uh, pro providing ammonia for some uh, for, for, for ships, but it was banned by the city. City board as stakeholder need to be engaged before uh, 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 any energy transition project. We have created uh, around 22 groups of stakeholders uh, and uh, subgroups of agencies and participants, and also showed their contractual, contractual relationships. Uh, either they are uh, in direct uh, relationship, particularly for the energy transition, and also if they are primary or secondary. We included also the, the new stakeholders, such as technology developers and manufacturers, energy providers, energy transition facilitator, and third party, uh, and also even the consumers themselves. Now, uh, I have conducted a, 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 a summer institute for the uh, professionals from developing countries about decarbonization and energy transition. And many questions arose that, what is there in, for us? Why we need to, do, uh, to engage in, in port decarbonization or energy transition as it is not our fault. We are not the ones who emit largest. So we provided some uh, kind of opportunities and those applicable not only for developed developing countries, but also for the de de developed countries. Decarbonization can be an approach that enhances port competitiveness because the adoption of decarbonization puts ports on a sustainable track. So they screen their image, which could attract environmentally friendly shipping lines and customers who prefer ports with low than high carbon footprints. With stringent uh, regulations and scrutiny from end customers and consumers, the shippers and consignees would prefer ports committed to decarbonization goal. Meeting such demand give ports access to global green market. Decarbonization also creates new jobs and opportunities and thus accelerate uh, economic growth. For example, the investment in wind and solar energy renewables research and development as well, and other innovative technologies revolutionize sustainable and green industries in these countries. 
Decarbonization efforts also improve the air quality and public health in surrounding communities. So there is social environmental benefits. In other words, technologies that reduce CO2 emission, most of the time reduce other air pollutants by catch. Implementing decarbonization attract international support, which can mitigate the issues, barriers we already explained, particularly economic and information. The global economies and in, uh, initiatives introduced by the IMO, the EU, the C2, uh, C40 cities can provide the required technical and financial support for the, those countries. Developing countries also can benefit from the international uh, incentives, such as the revenues of the future IMO market-based measures or the EU uh, 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 emission trading schemes, which will be presented by our colleague from the World Bank subsidies and grants and, uh, and among others. So those can support decarbonization efforts and mitigate the financial costs. This, this engaged ports in the global realm of new businesses. Many ports, including development countries ports, can play a part in the uh, value chain of the production and distribution of zero and near zero CO2 emission technologies, renewable fuels and sources uh, for the international shipping and for decarbonization. While this might be profitable, it also mitigate, can mitigate some barriers, such as not being distanced by the future market-based measures, particularly least developed countries and island states. And this also may lower the cost of transport by having fewer ship calls because they are uh, part of the logistics chains of the uh, 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 new uh, fuels. The decarbonization and energy transition also increases the, the security of the supply, energy supply. Ports can take part in energy transition, can overcome insecurity in energy supplies, both by the current energy crisis in Europe due to Ukraine-Russia conflict or recent pandemic. As such, seaports uh, need to have sustainable and energy goals in their strategic plan. Last but not least, let me highlight here uh, one study we did recently. One of our master students also did under my supervision to, to help uh, decarbonize the, our home port in Jordan, uh, port of Aqaba. First, uh, first we, we see here the, the emission inventory. As uh, said in management, you, you cannot uh, manage what you can measure. So we, we collected data, primary data from the port about their uh, uh, energy uh, consumption and then did the emission inventory. Uh, then also uh, data about the electricity and we showed how, 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 how much electricity consumption then also reflected to CO2 equivalent. And this is only for scope one, uh, the, the uh, equipment and scope two, the, the, the uh, they purchased electricity. Then also we, we downloaded uh, data points uh, uh, from Copernicus uh, for uh, uh, solar radiation in that in Aqaba and wind speed for three years to check how constant the, the, the radiation and wind and it showed that it is constant and also has potential to provide uh, uh, good energy. Then we developed a Python code and also uh, 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 created three scenarios, one based on wind uh, turbines uh, to cover uh, the, 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 to decarbonize uh, only scope one. Now we are working also in scope two. So we, 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 we did a study about wind uh, the, the turbine generation, one also to the right side, uh, the upper right side about uh, the, the photovoltaics, and we uh, did one uh, as a mix hybrid between the two. Uh, the last step we did economic valuation and recommendation for the port. We directly communicated with the port and send them our results. And we can see that the, 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 the best scenario is to use the, 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 the photovoltaics because of their uh, lowest levelized cost of energy. Uh, the, the also the highest net present value and the payback period is very short. Uh, this is uh, 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 done for scope one. Now we are currently doing scope three, two, and also we will in the future do scope three. And this is how decarbonization starts, step by step, until we reach the goal of zero carbon emission by 2050. With, with that, I conclude my slides, and I'm open for the uh, questions if it's allowed by the moderator, or we take it uh, later on. 
Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Dr. Alamush, for that um, insightful presentation and uh, a look at some of the work that you have been doing under the um, the C Energy project. Um, we don't. I will open the floor up now for questions. Um, so if you do have a question to ask Dr. Alamush, what you'll do is use the raise hand function. Um, and I, I will ask you to unmute yourself. You could ask your question and then um, um, Dr. Almush will provide your answer. Are there any questions from the floor or the, um, this morning? This means that uh, the presentation is uh, clear or they didn't understand, I think. <laughs> so <laughs> decide about <the> it. <laughs> But I think, Stephen, oh. also you attended our last uh, uh, workshop. I have seen you uh, yes. uh, as a representative of the MTC. And thank you for, uh, for supporting uh, our project. So this is also great to share uh, your expertise in this. Dr. Alamush, we have a question. What role does the port state control play in the facilitation of decarbonization? Port state control is port. Uh, 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 most of that it depends where and uh, and uh, about the country itself. In my country, for example, port state control is under the the the, the maritime authority, which is uh, not playing so much role into decarbonization itself compared to the port authority itself or the port operator. But they can play a role dependent on how much power and authority they are given. Some of uh, countries, this mission is not for the port state. Some of countries, the mission is the for port state control. So it is different from one country to another, depends on the governance model, uh, how port is managed. But certainly, any maritime uh, authority, port authority, port operator, of course, play a, a key role in decarbonization. Here we are talking about the role of the port authority uh, uh, port managing body in, in top, which is the public authorities, the board of governance uh, and uh, corporations, uh, the port uh, authority itself, and also the port operators need to be engaged. Not only they are doing the business, but they, they need to play a part in the carbonization. And many, many private operators, uh, global operators, start working on decarbonization themselves to prove to, to, to prove they, that they are doing something okay thank you dr Halamush. um i have a question um the payback period for the renewable energy system that you will have done right um is it that you have um over the past decade or the past couple of years that there has been improvement in the payback period and the cost of this um, renewable energy system for implementation at the port? Yes, uh, we, we, we use the ARENA or IA uh, 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 cost for each kilowatt, which was, uh, I think it was 1,000, now it was in Dow dollars, but now 700. Not currently it's around, I am not sure exactly, but it is going down. Uh, uh, considerably, it's around uh, uh, five hundred dollars for each uh, kilowatt oh. in terms of construction. And so we, yes, of course, the, the cost of renewable energy is particularly photovoltaics is going down, and which is helpful for ports, as can the the case that we showed. It it is it, the payback period is short. Uh, the the light cost of energy is very low, so it is profitable for port to at least to decarbonize uh, uh, scope two. And it also this depends on in the in in, in the port. In in, in Jordan, uh, there there is uh, uh, we, we, uh, there is agreement with the ports or uh, any or any any renewable energy providers to dump access of renewable energy to the to the grid. They accept it. Uh, so this also lower the price. But some other ports, they don't accept this. And then the ports need to have their own energy storage, which raise the price of the uh, energy. So this shows the importance of the stakeholders. 
the, the, the country uh, uh, utilities uh, grids to facilitate the energy transition. So apart from actually powering the port, some of these, these um, ports provide energy to the neighboring um, communities and so on, and cities. Um, I come up with this. If the, if the, is this a question? Or no, I'm just making a comment. So apart yes, from. Yes, of course, of course. All right. With just seven more years to go to achieve the decade of action, what percentage would you say are we globally in achieving decarbonization? Uh, uh, well, uh, come up again because I didn't hear. Very well. Ask again. With just seven more years to go to achieve the decade of action, what percentage would you say we are globally in achieving decarbonization? This is a question we have more experts today. <laughs> yes, <laughs> yes, I think there I is a presentation. For, uh, Professor uh, Jan. Yes, <laughs> or the there is a presentation. We, we, we do our best. We do our best. The situation is not, uh, I mean, um, it's not good uh, regarding decarbonization. And in my own view, every one of us, individuals, uh, institutions, organizations, have a role to play in decarbonization, and we have to start now, sooner than later. Thank you very much, Dr. Alamush. I'm seeing a number of questions coming up in the question and answer tab. And I believe some of these will be answered in subsequent presentations that we have this morning. So what I will do, we will save some of these questions as we go through the proceedings this morning. And some may be relevant, some will get the answers from the presentations or we will bring it back up and discuss it when we have the um, the panel um, at the end of the, um, towards the end of this morning. All right, so I think um, that is a way that we will proceed moving forward. Thank you very much, um, Dr. Alish. Mr. Bihari. Yes, thank you. Um, do I have to share a screen or anything or I will pop up? You go ahead. Okay, good. Um, yes, you're quite correct. Quite a number of these questions. And I'm quite sure Gordon is paying particular attention to the discussions, uh, will be addressed by the moderator. Um, it's subject to review and consideration, of course, uh, because we have some limited time there. But once we can save some time and put it towards the moderated panel discussion, I'm sure we can address further discussions there on these important uh, topics of regulation of um, decarbonized uh, strategies and so on. So let me now turn our attention to uh, Dr. Jan Hoffman, uh, Head of Trade Logistics Branch Division on Technology and Logistics at UNCTAD, United Nations Conference on Trade and Development, uh, based in Geneva, Switzerland. Jan joined the United Nations Conference on Trade and Development, UNCTAD, in 2003 and became head of the organization's Trade Logistics Branch in 2016. Branch, the branch is implementing multilateral transport and trade facilitation capacity building programs, as well as regional and national projects in Africa, in Asia, in the Pacific, and in Latin America and the Caribbean. Jan is co-author and uh, coordinator of the annual UNCTAD Review of Maritime Transport, uh, created and co-edits the quarterly transport and trade facilitation newsletter and initiated the Maritime Country Profiles, the International Transport Cost Dataset, and the Quarterly Liner Shipping Connectivity Index. Uh, most recently, you would have seen uh, the 2023 edition of the Review of Maritime Transport, which was released earlier in the month of October. Previously, Jan spent six years with the United Nations Con um, Economic Commission for Latin America and the Caribbean, ECLAC, in Santiago de Chile, and two years with the International Maritime Organization, IMO, in London and Santiago. Prior to this, he has part-time positions as assistant professor. Uh, he was an import-export agent, a seafarer, a translator, and a consultant. And for eight years, he also worked part-time in his father's family tram shipping business, Hoffman Shipping, uh, based in Horneburg, uh, Germany, uh, with a twin decker registered in St. John's, Antigua, and Barbuda. Jan has studied in Germany, United Kingdom, and Spain, and he holds a doctorate degree in economics from the University of Hamburg. Jan has worked as 
has, his work has resulted in numerous UN and peer-reviewed publications, lectures, technical missions, databases, and electronic newsletters. Jan is a member of the AJSL, FFSC, IJSTLU, INCU, JST, MEL, and MPM. The latter two I know, which is the uh, Maritime Economics and Logistics Journal and the Maritime Policy and Management Journal. Uh, he's a member of the IAME, International Association of Maritime Economists. Uh, he was president of the IAME uh, from the period 2014 to 2018, and he's a member of the Propeller Club of Geneva. Now, a very interesting fact. Yan has been to 130 countries and has had his hair cut in 80 countries. Um, Jan and I are personal friends, and our friendship extends for more than 35 years. I think we were young researchers uh, back then, and when we were looking at exploring a very virgin territory within the Caribbean and Latin America. So I have a lot of um, uh, warm feelings towards Jan, and I always tell him he represents to me the epitome of what a United Nations personality should be. Mm. Because if you ask him for the shirt on his back, he would readily give it to you if you felt that you needed it. That is his personality. Mm -hmm. So without further ado, let me introduce my good friend and colleague, Professor Jan Hoffman. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Adrian. Very kind words. And uh, yes, uh, there we are. We're actually very good in our timing, even a bit early. And I thought I won't even use my all half an hour because yeah, hopefully we have time for discussion. So as we had discussed, I will complement the, the very nice previous presentation from our friends at the World Maritime University, which gave some fundamentals with uh, some yeah, latest data updates from our review of maritime transport. We're very proud of this publication since 1968. So let me start sharing the screen so that you can see uh, that uh, you will now see my office. That's the building there from where we produce the review of my time transport. And here is the latest cover. Um, and yeah, it has a special chapter. It has the usual update. And I, I'm a bit making a sales pitch to all of you. This fascinating, great publication. It's a lot of country rankings of port performance, connectivity, really a lot of data. We have a statistical online annex beyond this publication, but we had a special chapter about decarbonization. And we launched the review this year in London, in the presence of the Secretary General of the IMO. And it was really, well, it was a lot of extra tension and work. We make sure we don't step on each other's feet and we shoot in the same direction. But it actually worked out quite nicely, although some IMO friends were also surprised. Um, and I confess I was surprised that some colleagues were surprised. Um, so this chart here and the associated uh, press release and so on is was among the most quoted in the international press and commentator, social media. It shows that the topic we are discussing here in this webinar, and uh, I forgot to thank all of you for the organization and for inviting me, uh, congratulations. Uh, and this chart shows that global emissions have still been going up. Um, emissions from shipping went up by about 20%. And we wrote this in our press release and some people said, said are you sure, can we check? So I double checked and actually depends how exactly you calculate from year to year or quarter to quarter. They went up by 21% or 22%. Um, what explains this, this up and down the, the trend. The main explanation is, of course, if trade and volumes grow up, and as long as we have not done all the things that we are discussing today in this webinar, emissions will go up in parallel. Maybe not quite as fast, but they, they do go up. No? So the long-term growth trend is due to growing trade, combined with, and I'll show you some charts, Growing distances, that's another interesting development. Even, it's not only that tons have gone up, but ton miles have gone up even more. And what explains these up and downs, this volatility? 
this is not so much volatility in volumes, but this is to some extent changes in speed. Yeah, if you go slower, that's the relatively easiest way to reduce emissions per ton per ton mile at a, at a given point in time. So here you can see there are really the three main vessel types, the tankers, the dry bulk and general cargo and the containers, they make out like more than three quarters of the emissions and then come the other specialized ships. But it's really the three main segments. Um, the good news is that effectively the emissions per ton mile have gone down. So this is of maybe what what people, many people, in, you can criticize, you can ridicule that things are not advancing as far as they should, but but there have been sincere efforts going on at national region level at the IMO with different technical measures, short-term measures. So the emissions per ton mile have been going down, especially in containers. And containers are the ones that tend to be to emit more per ton mile because they mostly go faster. They have a different type of service and you have to carry the, the containers. It's so actually per ton mile, it's, it's twice as much as, uh, or as the uh, bulk cargo, for example. Bulk cargo, these huge bathtubs, they go very slow and yeah, they emit less. No? So this is the good news. So I started with bad news. There's some the good news. And now comes the third slide, which is actually from last year's review, where we analyzed this in a bit more detail. Half of the improvement is due to economies of scale, not due to technological improvements or operational port call optimization or alternative fuels. So on the left side, you see the typical, we call it the CO2 emission intensity of container ships by ship size. And you see how the smaller ships emit two or three times, almost yeah, three times as much as the biggest. Those of you who, who know me over the years and Adrian mentioned working for, for ECLAC, um, we are not, I'm personally not a fan of the big ships. Big ships, huge container ships, they do pose challenges for the market concentration, consolidation, um, especially when you're a small island developing states and, and ships get bigger, volume does not grow, so you have space for fewer companies two sides of the same coin. Uh, also, you need, without adding volume, you need to dredge deeper, you need bigger crane, you need a bigger yard, you need to have longer, higher peak demand. So I'm not a fan of big ships, but we have to acknowledge uh, half of the improvement we have seen <laughs> over the last 20 years was due to economies of scale because ship sizes have been going up. So that's facts. That's the reality. That's our latest data reporting. And one thing we are also quite proud of, I think already three years ago for the first time, I think it might have been, yeah, I think it was in 2021, 20, 22, yeah, the, and, and in 2020, we, with our, with, with partners in Marine Benchmark, I acknowledge really their collaboration you can assign emissions to the polluter. And that's important without as yet going into who is polluting how much. You know, shipping and air transport was not initially included in the Paris Agreement where all countries agreed to decarbonize and had their objectives and they, they gave uh, some special conditions, permits to decarbonize a little later to the developing countries, to the most vulnerable. So in, in this agreement, shipping and air transport were not included because that was like outside the countries. And 
it was more difficult to assign to a country or that's over the horizon you cannot assign. But nowadays with technology, with tracing, tracking, AIS and reporting to the IMO, you we do know which ship emits how much and we know from the ship which flag they fly. We know the owner for at least for bigger ships, for almost all ships, we know the country of ownership. We also know who is the trader, like which is the exporting country, the importing country. You can also even identify in which geographical area the emissions take place. So this is really here not to point the finger at Liberia, Panama, or Marshall Islands. They do emit more because they have bigger fleets. No surprise here. And Liberia just overtook Panama as number one registry again in, in terms of tonnage. Neither am I pointing the finger to China, Japan, or Greece. Uh, but it, if you compare these figures with um, the fleet data by number of ships or by tonnage, there it's not 100% proportional. So for example, um, Germany is no longer the sixth biggest ship owner. <laughs> they, they, they have their share in ownership has gone down. But in terms of emissions, they are relatively big because the German ship owners own container ships and container ships emit more than tankers and bike carriers. So, so I, I hope you see what I'm getting at. No? Same, the differences between the registries is not necessarily that some are better or worse, but they may uh, host different ships. But some of this, and that's why I keep this slide here. The, there is potential. So there's potential for economic measures, even by the ship owner with tax regimes or the registry with fees, admissions. Uh, some of you may know that I used to work for a little shipping company called Hoffman Shipping. We had a tween decker. We registered our tween decker in Antigua and Barbuda. Uh, we tried, my father, Captain Hoffman, tried to register it in Panama, but Panama would not want us because we are too old. Not because it was a good ship and well-maintained and excellent captain and seafarer. But um, so, so flags, and especially the bigger flags, they do have a potential to also influence. So that's a bit, the, the main message here is you can assign who is actually the emitter or the polluter when we come to the polluter pays principle. Um, coming a bit to the explanation, some of these like why did emissions still go up? So here you see the growth year by year by year. We did have a decline after the financial crisis. You see 2008, um, it, there was a de decline in the growth rate between eight and nine and um, then again, when, when COVID started, uh, what I find actually more interesting than the ups and downs is if you look a bit closer, there are far more years, especially recently, where the ton miles, the orange line, is growing more than the blue line, the tons. So this means the distance traveled has gone up. And this is the second chart that was very much quoted, highlighted in the press reporting about our review. Uh, and when, when I drafted the first draft press releases and news items, I said, we have reached historical highs in heights and, and records, historical records in distance traveled for, for grain, for other dry bulk and for oil. And then some more careful colleagues of mine they said, Jan, you're wrong. We don't, no, no, sorry, not that I'm wrong, but we don't know. In this chart, we are showing data starting 1999, but for most of these, we have it actually since 1980. So I can say confidently, since 1980, for the data on record, we have highest distance on record. But we do not know if in the 1970s, when the Suez Canal was closed, maybe oil tankers traveled even longer distances that we don't know. But, but the key point here is that thanks 
to overall improving efficiency of the shipping business. <laughs> to different geography of trade, there has been a long-term trend of increasing distance. And most recently, it's rather negative reasons or sad news. Uh, grain distance have further increased because there is less grain coming out of the Ukraine. <laughs> and so Egypt has to buy grain from further away from say US or Brazil. So the distance goes up. The oil distance goes up because the Russian oil now no longer goes much to Europe, but it goes to India and, and China. So that's, it's not directly linked to colonization, but it also gives you a bit of background, broader long-term trends. Uh, shipping keeps growing and distance of this growing trade has so far even increased leading for more demand for for fuel. Um, now, this is the demand side. No? I showed you the growth of trade, the distance. Now on the supply side, uh, here you see the order book. What's the world order book in cargo carrying capacity? And with hindsight, I actually think we should have made this different. Uh, here, I give you the absolute numbers, plus the orange line is the growth, but the blue is really the important one. That's the order book on the left-hand scale. It's in absolute terms, but if I were to put this in relative terms, in percent of the existing fleet, it would have gone down much, much more because the fleet was only half as big in the 2009, 2010, than it is now. Now the fleet is twice as big. So the order book in percent of the fleet is even lower. Why is this important? And Adrian referred to a news item, which I shared. I can't claim credit for this article. It was from Splash 24, but I found it insightful that it showed that there is concern. There may not even be enough shipyard capacity to build all the new ships that we need. Yeah? And I come back to my favorite demand and supply curves in a, in a few minutes, why, why this matters. Um, if we have learned one thing during the supply chain crisis is that if there's not quite enough capacity and or there's more demand than supply, freight rates can go through the roof. They increase tremendously. Demand is very inelastic, very steep demand curve. You really want your iPhone for Christmas, whatever it costs to transport. I am a small island. I really need my fuel, my food, whatever it costs to transport. I produce something and I really need the machinery, the parts. So transport is only a part and demand is very inelastic. Whatever it costs, I need it. So if there's one ship too little, or ships are idle because they are reconverted, or ships are in ports stuck, congested because of COVID, then there's not enough supply compared to the demand and freight rates increased during COVID container freight at five to seven fold. So why does it matter? If we don't have enough supply and we see there's not much ships on order, then we may again have a shortage of the ships we need to carry our trade. And this is worrying in the context of the, the different and new ships that we will need when we decarbonize. So how does this link to decarbonization, to climate change? Uh, this one is now a bit broader picture. Um, more general thinking that, that then found its way in the policy recommendations that we have in the review maritime transport. So some of this used to be a bit Hoffman's personal opinion, but I'm happy to report that after a lot of consultations in-house and I, I come to this, there is now a, like official anchored opinion in favor of some of these these measures, these opinions here, you know, the, the polluter pays principle, uh, economic measures, and, and um, yeah, some of the, the support we also give to the IMO negotiations. Who pays today for climate change? Because we are talking about cost increase, we are talking about 
higher freight rates. We are talking about levies. We are talking about more expensive fuels. No, so who pays? And then people say that costs. And I'm saying, well, already today, some other people pay. Coastal population in Bangladesh whose lands are flooded, they pay. Investors in the Bahamas whose properties are devastated, they pay. Farmers in Mali with failing crops, they already pay. Families in the Pacific, homes are disappearing, they pay. And here in Switzerland, when the rich Swiss, we run out of snow, we also pay. Yeah? So some people are already paying. And, and I find this important to remind us that there is a cost associated with climate change, with higher sea levels, with more frequent storms, with changing weather patterns. It's not necessarily that one weather pattern is better than the other or worse, but the adaptation again has costs. You, people may need to migrate and you have to adjust your farming and so on. Who should pay? The polluter should pay. The polluter should be given three options. Now, this is microeconomics 101. Uh, long ago, I was teaching this before I even knew about that IMO existed or that climate change would come up. I didn't know about it, but we were teaching that internalization of external means you give the actor, the, the polluter, the car driver, the factory, the shipping line, the, the whoever can produce an externality and might produce noise or pollution or accidents. No, you decide number one, okay, if I would have to pay for the accidents, noise, pollution, illnesses I am causing, maybe I don't pollute. I go slower. I use clean fuel. I near source. Or once the oil spill has happened, um, no, sorry, before it happens, <laughs> I, I can uh, build walls against noise from the car, or I build flood walls, I invest in the pots, I construct hurricane resilient cranes. So this is the adaptation in a way, or I clean up after the oil has been spilled. No? And if all this is too late, I compensate. And it doesn't sound popular. And people say, no, no, we, we don't want, we don't want oil spills to happen. We don't want uh, emissions in ports that cause lung cancer. You know, port cities are among the most polluted ones with more air pollution, small particles causing lung cancer. So, but does this mean we will now stop trading tomorrow? No. And I'm honestly, I'm not among those who say we don't need strawberries in winter. If you want your strawberries in winter, that's fine. But please pay for the externality. And then you choose. Maybe if you have to pay for all the negative externalities, maybe then you don't buy the strawberries in winter. Yeah, but, but that's I feel this is really a it's a market-based solution in that sense. Although some people say a levy or so is not a market, but the, it means it's the economic actor who decides. Uh, so with this in mind. Market-based measures have been introduced at the IMO. They are now actually called economic measures. Um, and it basically means you give a price on greenhouse gas emissions, call it a levy or market price or a trading scheme or a contribution. So this is being discussed. And I know that Dominique, he will give more details about what to do, potential. I know he has excellent detailed slides and propose. I'm, I'm a bit more general here. And I, I'm stepping one step back or another, what is now 28 years ago. Um, when I worked for the International Maritime Organization, I wrote this document. I'm The more time passes, the more proud I am about it. That was, um, the, to my knowledge, and I've asked colleagues in the IMO, the first official IMO document that introduced this concept. So I had just come from university. I taught this at university. I arrived in London with my PhD, with my little kids, and I was going to save the world. I will save the world. I will introduce sliced bread. No, I will introduce the internalization of costs. And I explained it and had PowerPoints. And, and then at some point in time, I overheard how one director from a Coast Guard spoke to another director who was a lawyer and said, what is Hoffman talking about? All this internationalization of externalities. 
And I continue to find this very funny. I'm sorry, I can't hear your loud laughter, but it's not about internationalizing, it's about internalizing. And that is where we are now heading to. So a levy on CO2, it is by now proposed by many uh, from Marshall Islands. And here, don't confuse here the Marshall Islands proposal with the registry. It's really the country, the low-lying country that has wise politicians and is proactive and positive with this proposal because they know if we don't fight climate change, we will sink. But also shippers, Trafigura, for example, made a proposal. They know we will not get to decarbonization if alternative fuels are not competitive. And how can they become competitive? If the old fuels, the bad fuels become more expensive. So you see, uh, Internal Chamber of Shipping, maybe not quite as ambitious, but, but still, I see a lot of change. And for us in UNCTAD, this was very important. This really helped us in-house in, in the discussions. I'm not sure if you can read the small print at the bottom right, but um, there is a long list of our stakeholders, of UNCTAD member countries, least developed countries, small island developing countries, who have signed this um, declaration at the COP in, in Glasgow and have yeah, encouraged IMO to look into this. And that's why we are now also, I would say, officially supporting this. And I, this meeting here is recorded. We say in our press release, we, we put it in writing, it's not ANCTA to decide. ANCTA is mandated to help develop research advice, technical assistance to support developing countries. It is, of course, not UNCTAD, but it is the IMO. It is the IMO member states to decide. We are only there to provide background information research. So I'm not, it's, it's not us to decide, but we are tasked to provide background information and analysis. So what are we actually talking about potentially, just to give you an order of magnitude? So I looked, how many tons of fuel are actually burned every year. And then you know that's something for the dinner table to impress your mother-in-law. How many kilos of CO2 do you produce if you burn one liter of fuel with your car or diesel? So you burn one liter, one liter. How many kilos of CO2 do you produce? It's about three times more, 3.15 times more because each C atom gets married with two O oxygen atoms. That's why it is CO2. <laughs> and they have roughly the same weight. And so it becomes three times more heavy. So if I use these three numbers here, I end up with $72 billion per year of total carbon levy. Now, the proposal is not that all this will be a net contribution. Some of this may be a discount for the alternative fuels. And of course, very, very important. You only pay if you burn fuel that uses CO2. The moment you switch to alternative fuels or combine with wind power or with solar or nuclear or anything else, then you no longer pay this. And so that's important uh, because oh, 72 billion. Oh, oh yes, I'm in favor. I want UNCTAD to manage this and I want just 1% commission. No, it's not about this. It's, but I still want to share with you the order of magnitude of, of this. So, but I'm optimist. Technological progress will never be as slow as today. Is it slow? No, it's not slow, it's fast. But it's going to be even faster. So there was um, a discussion. Um, who was it? Some, somebody said, uh, oh, the technologies we need to achieve our ambition in decarbonization, they do not yet exist. And then some NGO were very critical, ridiculing, and so on. But I actually, I, I agree with this. Even though they do not yet exist, you know how long it takes to develop national, regional, IMO, multilateral regulation. It's a very, very, very slow process. So we need to develop today the regulation, the ambition, 
the economic measure, the technical measure for the technologies of the future. And these are advancing. So one last key message before I come to three conclusions. And now I will show you my dear beloved demand and supply curve. So this is a standard my, uh, shipping economics 101. It looks a bit different from what you learn in your basic textbook, microeconomics 101, where you have demand and supply curve a little bit different. You have a demand curve, the green one, a little bit more horizontal and the pink one, whatever, you know, we males, we can see fewer colors than females. So I think this is probably pink, this color, but uh, so the, the supply curve, this is um, normally put like a straight line, but in shipping, you have for a long period, a rather flat, very elastic supply. But the moment you reach a capacity limit, it becomes practically vertical because ships, you cannot increase speed much. Once you have no idle capacity, there you are. You need, say somebody needs 20 ships to carry iron ore from Brazil to China, but there are only 19. But you really, really, really need this iron ore to build your manufactured goods, your iPhones, whatever. So prices go through the roof. So this is a standard, really, it's, it's uh, Martin Stopford, I think, was the first one, but it's standard shipping economics. So what happens if costs go up? Well, the supply curve goes a little bit up. It will only have a relatively small impact on trade volumes because demand is rather inelastic. But what happens if we don't act fast? What happens if the ship owner doesn't know what will be the future carbon price? What fuel, if he is not sure, he, he orders a new ship, but doesn't know um, whether the fuel will be available when he goes to some far away small island state. Um, also on the demand side, we have uncertainty, uh, especially in the oil tanker. So if economies start prohibiting normal, like classical cars uh, that burn diesel or other fuel and impose electric cars, for example. So the, the tanker owner doesn't know the demand for his cargo in 25, 30 years. Maybe he can transport other liquid cargo, but so there's a lot of uncertainty. And that is where I had the earlier picture with you, please remember the one with the blue bars about the order book. So the order book is low. And here's what happens. The supply is not growing as much as it should be. And if we put more on the brakes, on the advances at the IMO, if we say, oh, oh I, I need an even more comprehensive, comprehensive, comprehensive impact assessment done by the IMO. And that will take very long. And that is why I, I, will, not, uh, I will not yet agree to some measure. So yes, we will do it. We work on it. We do it as fast as we can, but, but please don't wait for us. Please agree as soon as possible <laughs> on technical and economic measures to avoid that the supply curve moves to the left or demand grows, goes to the right, and the supply doesn't follow. Because as we have seen, if there's slightly not enough supply, freight rates can very quickly increase and increase more and become more volatile than by a small carbon levy. Three opportunities, positive spirit. Developing countries are also potential providers of alternative fuels. So here's from actually the same COP event where this Glasgow declaration came out. You know, zero carbon emissions present a business and development opportunity for several developing countries. In the past, the bunker fuel market was a very non-inclusive market. Countries with large oil reserves could participate, others maybe not. Um, and yes, I admit our dear friends in Trinidad, you do benefit from fossil fuels and you will continue to sell LNG, and I'm glad that nevertheless you invited Dominique, who is particularly not happy about LNG, and, and I actually I am with Dominique. <laughs> uh, it's not really the long-term solution, but, but still, on the positive side, Trinidad too can also provide alternative fuels, power to X, convert this to alternative fuels. Second opportunity, 
with an economic measure, we generate funding and we can invest this in improved trade logistics. We have simulated impacts of improving maritime transport cost determinants. That was actually from, from last year's review or, or two years ago already. So I didn't put here the whole econometrics, but with, with Gordon, we had worked on several studies. What explains maritime transport costs and what can be done to reduce maritime transport costs? And we are together seeing that like a port that is privately operated vis-a-vis -a, -vis a port that is government run, the privately operated tends to have, lead to lower maritime transport costs, lower waiting times. You know, Gordon, we had done this one of the Caribbean also, or more competition or better port infrastructure. So I always say, if we invest the money right in strengthening competition authorities, customs automation, climate resilient, cranes, stretching, what have you, we can reduce shipping costs. So that's the opportunity number two. And the number last but not least, the three, it's really the, the big enthusiastic message. The maritime industry has the historical opportunity to be ahead of the curve. It can shape one global multilateral framework. Other industries need to implement many national frameworks where there's the risk of free riders, no global force, but here it's the same for all, as long as those who are weak and smaller um, get some economic incentives because they you cannot have a special deal. You cannot have substandard shipping in some region and, and, and not in, in others. So that's uh, mostly from our last review of time transport with some longer term background. In the end, I think I did eat up my half hour because uh, I spoke so enthusiastically and went on and on about some of the slides. But uh, here's the acknowledgement to all my dear co-authors and friends and reviewers. This is really a big teamwork, the review of maritime transport. And here are the links where you find the, the review, you find our maritime statistics and where you can contact us. And, and this file will, of course, be shared with Adrian and the team and you will also have it. Thank you. Excellent. Stefan? Thank you very much, Dr. Hoffman. Um, I would like to open up the floor now to some questions. Um, anybody, again, you guys can use the raise hand function. Um, we will allow uh, you to unmute and you could ask your questions. Right, Did so they believe everything I told them? That's, that's good. <laughs> In this issue of the economic measure, it has been very controversial. I honestly think it is no longer controversial in the in the substance. Of course, some people are more or less happy about it or worried. Or, um, I see there's a hand up, but just yeah. also again to it's the reiterate. If you do not have an economic measure, there are two options. Either it means, okay, I don't want to decarbonize. And that's one option. There, there are some people say, I don't care that much about climate change, my country or my business not that much affected. I don't want to pay more. Okay. But if you agree that by certain dates, you want to have achieved certain reductions and by 2050 at zero, then a combination of technical and economic measure is less costly. So the argument to be against the costs and the fear of uh, who is going to pay, it's really the, the false argument. If you only have technical measures, the cost increases to shipping will be even higher because then you have command control. And and I mean, it's, it's a longer story, but the I, I really feel quite strongly about the, also to those friends and countries whom I understand who are worried about the additional cost, uh, please know that um, delaying and, and opposing the economic measure will not reduce the cost. Subject to the underlying agreement, we do want to decarbonize. Uh, Ian Wallace has his uh, hand up. Yeah, uh, yes, hello, good day. Um, yes, I'm uh, from uh, Trinidad and Tobago. And as a meteorologist, um, I noticed the drought in Panama 
And the fact that the Panama Canal, the water levels dropped drastically that large ships weren't able to go through the canal. Mm. So given your graph about smaller ships contributing more emissions compared to the larger ships, how would you all address that with these regards to canal levels dropping due to droughts and so on? Mm -hmm. um, yeah, uh, three thoughts here. The, in fact, the three biggest registries, Panama, Liberia, and Marsh Islands, they are all three countries who are even more than the average country affected by climate change, like we see now with the Panama Canal, the, the draft, and, and the canal is losing business. So Panama has a significant economic impact due to the climate change. So I, I call upon the registries to do what is in their power to have economic measures on the registry level. If just the top five registries were to get together, the, the main, the strong ones, uh, register more than half of the world fleet. And if they were to give lower or penalty fees to bad ships, older ships, more emitting ships, I don't know. That's, you didn't ask that question, but I thought it was also a good answer to a different question. Now about the, the, the smaller, bigger ships, I'm not quite sure if I see the association there, but um, the Panama Canal has its limitation. It was expanded, but still the ships that go through the Panama Canal today are only a little more than half as big as the biggest ships that exist in, in container, dry bulk, and, and oil. So it's actually only the smaller ships that, that pass by the Panama Canal. Um, but I'm not suggesting that we should... Um, I just got a Zoom message here. No, I hope I'm still with you. Yeah, I'm... Um, so, yeah, I'm... I, I answered a different question than the one you asked and about the ship sizes. Maybe you want to be a bit more like clarify why, what could Panama do to, to increase bigger ships? Should they build a bigger canal to, or should we buy, build a canal in Colombia or Nicaragua that is sea level? And no, I'm not suggesting this. <laughs> I'm not sure if Ian, I cannot hear you, but I did. I don't hear anybody. Hi. I hope I'm with you. Uh, yes. Hello. Yes. Hello. Um, I got you. Um, yes, you answered my question, and um, obviously, the from the the weather point of view, I've been looking at the fact that you you talk about how the larger ships and what their contributions are well within the the emissions. So. I suppose you have you've proposed whether we build more canals, uh, but that's one part. Uh, I suppose the other part is we have to obviously offset the amount of fuel that we're using, as well as to bring in uh, more greener types of methods. So, I mean, you've answered the question. Um, to my the point. biggest uh, competition to the Panama Canal is the land bridge in the United States, no? Um, because that in terms of volume and, and traffic. If you want to go to the East Coast or maybe to Chicago, you either go to Los Angeles and continue by train or you go all water up to New York. And all water up to New York emits more shipping emissions, but it emits the, the going by train, even though train is better than truck, but, but going by land, including train and truck, would be even more. There was a recent study that was promoted by some very interested parties that said um, going by train, uh, going through Los Angeles instead of the Panama Canal would be few emissions, but that was for one, one specific destination and uh, lots of assumptions and was heavily criticized. So, so please uh, believe us that going through the canal is better than going by land. All right. Well, for thank you very much. <laughs> Um, Dr. Hoffman, we do have some questions in the chat, mm -hmm. right? So I will read one out for you. Um, decarbonizing is a cost issue, you see. What are the incentives for lower income, small island developing states to invest in decarbonizing their ports? Prices in the islands are already soaring. 
And I want to um, add on to that to uh, one a question that I had, which is basically anyway, go ahead. The market based measures and how we yeah. accelerate the uptake of technologies. But yeah. Yeah, I mean there at the beginning of these discussions, negotiation, there was some thought, oh, could we allow some countries, regions to delay their decarbonization, but I personally feel quite strongly against this. Uh, we, we need one multilateral system. Um, ships are built by one country, manned by another, owned, operated by, so, uh, carry cargo. So having separate markets there is, is really not, not the long-term solution. You don't want substandard shipping in just the Pacific or so. Um, but um, and and for this reason, again, the the some of the sits have initially also expressed their concern. Oh, we already pay twice as much for our transport than the world average. That's according to Ankta data. So they quote Ankta data correctly. We calculated the average transport costs for sits for their import is twice the world average. And they depend more on shipping, of course. They don't cannot use by, by train or hinterland and so on. So if shipping prices go up, like they did during the supply chain crisis, that is also true, it's in response to this question. When we had the COVID crisis and container freight rates went up five to seven fold, the um, import prices, the, the inflation globally went up 1.5 percentage point additional. That was Ankta who simulated, calculated, was confirmed. SIDS inflation went up 8%, much more. So all this to say, the concern of SIDS, of small island developing states, that they will be negatively affected by higher prices due to decarbonization, it's a very, very valid concern. <laughs> but SITs are also even more negatively affected by climate change. So they're really between a rock and a hard place. And fortunately, I really want to command especially a number of Pacific Island SITs who have been proactive, have had the vision to say, we cannot, we cannot not decarbonize, number one. We understand we cannot ask for a special deal, but we agree, we propose, Marshall Islands, Solomon Islands proactively propose an economic measure that will help with all three things, having a multilateral solution, decarbonize, and generate funding that can then be invested in SITs, ports, and port modernization, trade station, climate change adaptation. So I hope that went in the direction of the questions answer. And that will that will answer one of the that that will partially answer one of the questions that I'm seeing here. How come small island developing states navigate the transition to low carbon or carbon neutral cruise ship operations, considering the inherent challenges such as limited resources, unique environmental vulnerabilities, and the crucial role of tourism in their economies? Yeah, I would. I must confess, we in Anktad, we are not looking much into cruise shipping, at least not in my my group. We are looking at the trans transport transition of goods. There are colleagues in the trade division that look at services, tourism. Um, we we could actually connect if there's an interest. By the way, in general, I'm happy to connect on on LinkedIn. I will respond to emails. Maybe not today, but I I will respond. So I could. On this issue of cruise and the blue economy, I have a couple of colleagues who are very enthusiastically working on other wider blue economy. So I'm happy to connect to this. Um, but in principle, in terms of decarbonization of the fuel, the, the same applies. So whether you want to use ammonia on a cruise ship, I'm not so sure because yeah, it's a bit more dangerous, a bit more smelly potentially, <laughs> but um, yeah, it, the, in principle, the same applies. So, so thanks. I have a question from Emma Perra. I see alguien quiere preguntarme en castellano. Adelante también. Hello. Yeah. 
sorry, the name is is but I, my name is Tabel Bonilla. I'm 19 years old. I'm studying logistic and intermodal transport in Panama. Uh, my father works at the Panama Canal, and he told me that part of the problem that can uh, that the canal is currently having is due to the expansion of the locks, uh, because the ships that are not destined uh, to pass through the expanded locks uh, are paying to have them allows them to pass through there. Um, then a lot of water is being used, filling especially the locks designed for the passage of large ships, and thus water is being waste. What do you think about that? Eh, sí, tu papá tiene razón. <risa> eh, Pero ¿qué le vamos a hacer? Sí, eh, es muy difícil predecir qué tipo, qué tamaño de buque lo, lo usa. El canal tiene lo positivo de, de poder diferenciar en sus precios eh, según el tamaño, según el tipo de buque, según la fiabilidad. Si tú te comprometes o que realmente los de con, portacontenedores quieren el slot cuando lleguen, mientras que algún granelero vacío puede esperar un poco más. Así um, hay ciertamente un potencial del canal de Panamá de diferenciar en, en definir los precios, pero es, es cierto que se desperdicia un poco de agua, pero yo no sé cómo lo vamos a evitar. Ahí estamos. I do hope you were able to answer his question. We have a question from Diraj Massey. Yes, good morning. Uh, Mahis, Diraj Mahis, a uh, in Trinidad. Um, I just have a, a comment and, and possibly a question, but first of all, I, I just want to say thank you to uh, Mr. Biari for the invite and of course the chair Professor Imbert and yourself, Mr. Nanan. Um, Professor Hoffman made a comment regarding um, the CO2 emissions um, in terms of uh, present fuel, yeah, making them more, well, expensive as you as you mentioned, in terms of trying to discourage you know, that, that, that usage. And I'm just thinking of your thoughts on, on the same light um encouraging manufacturers on newer fuels possibly to be less expensive but more so the um we, we know the cost of uh, conversion and um, adaptation of, of vessels to um, lower that that co2 in terms of scrubbers and so on is is fairly expensive and, and some sort of international lobbying or, or, or cooperation in, in trying to lower that cost across the board so that it can assist vessels in, in different ways, maybe to assist in converting um, uh, or modifying, or maybe, um, you know, encouragement to use the, the new fuels that are available. Um, I think, you know, these these measures may possibly assist um, in, in, in getting more, 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 more uh, um, you know, cooperation in, in going that way. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah, I, I guess you are thinking about in a way um, some cross subsidy or, or development aid, uh, and this is of course also part of the package that is behind those who propose economic measures. No, uh, and I, Dominique has some really very valuable good thoughts which he will share with us after the coffee break, and we are already fifteen minutes late eating into your coffee break. Uh, about how how funds could be used to in which countries, which sectors, inside the sector, outside the sector. So I, I guess some of this will be answered by Dominique. And I would suggest I see there are a few other interesting questions. Uh, Paul Kent, good to see you. And and Thanos is there. Lots of friends. Uh, Angel, yeah. But but uh, I I would need to move on. I will continue the discussion later on with Gordon. But I think we should give the floor now to the next speaker, if so, you don't mind. <laughs> Perhaps one, thank you very much. I, 
And are there a number of questions within the chat that I will encourage the presenters mm -hmm. to address also, right? So this is very good to see active participation among the participants of the webinar. Um, so what we will do in light of time, we do need to take the coffee break. I mean, we need to give the translator a bit of a break on the other side also. But Mr. Bihari, I think we could, could we reduce the coffee break to 10 minutes this morning? Absolutely. So it's 11 a.m. 11 a.m. It's fine. Um, I so should be boiling the water in the meantime. All right. So let's take a 10 minutes break and we will return with the, um, the other presentations and the panel discussion this morning. Thank you. Very good. Thank you, Stefan. Adrian, come on. What? Why is my your name on my image? Right. So what happened is that in in expediting the link to you, I sent you my link. So when you click on that, you register. Oh, Adrian. Okay, so if you okay. if you leave the meeting, I just sent you a fresh link on the attachment. So when uh -huh. you put that attachment, you will see the email in the inbox. You click on that link, and it will bring you up as uh, yourself. Yeah. Well, in any in any case. I'm using MIC computer and this it, it it says MIC, so it doesn't really matter. All right, but it's on the screen, on my screen, you're showing up as Adrian Bihari. So yeah, you 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 tell him I'm your twin brother. <laughs> I'm the okay. tech. You you are the black and white version, and I'm the technical version. <laughs> I might be the wrong version. All right, <laughs> uh, I hope everything went well. I um I clicked off. Sorry, sorry. I clicked off my um. I don't know. I I accidentally. I don't know why. It seem to be automatically being muted. I don't know why. But you hearing me, right?
All right, welcome back everyone. Hi guys, welcome back to our attend attendees, uh, those who are in attendance. Uh, I'm seeing we're number in 169 and, and we probably uh, have even more attendance uh, as we progress towards the uh, final presentation with Dominique Inglet, as well as the panel discussion under the astute moderation of my good friend, Gordon Wilmsmeyer. Uh, let me introduce Dominique. Uh, and let me talk a, a, a very briefly uh, about the um, the way this panel um, was assembled. I met Dominique when I recently attended the annual International Association of, Association of Maritime Economists, our annual meeting in Long Beach, California. He delivered a very passionate uh, presentation at that um, conference, and he was a member of a um, panel discussion that was put on by the World Bank Group uh, subsequently uh, during the conference. So I invited him uh, to deliver what was originally intended as a guest lecture. And um, and we have developed this uh, with the support of uh, Professor Hoffman, uh, Professor Anas Alamush, and Professor Gordon Munzmeyer in today's, into today's webinar. And the purpose of the webinar as I said, is to increase awareness, to educate and to inform and to share information on the whole uh, question of decarbonization in the shipping and ports industry. Uh, Dominique Englert has turned his passion for fostering development and fighting climate change into his profession. In his efforts to decarbonize the global economy, he has worked as an economist at the World Bank in Washington, DC since 2015. I also did my internship at the World Bank, uh, leading the World Bank's uh, maritime team or maritime in the transport global practice. His main interests are in sustainable shipping and ports. While his focus is on decarbonizing maritime transport, he has also contributed to the World Bank's increasing engagement in addressing the shipping sector's digitalization and supply chain challenges in developing countries. From 2015 to 2020, Dominique was part of the World Bank's climate change group, working primarily on carbon pricing, policy making around the globe. Prior to joining the World Bank, Dominique was a senior advisor for climate change, uh, First Climate, a private consultancy firm based in Zurich, uh, Switzerland. He oversaw the carbon compliance management for large industrials, he advised public institution on climate policy and he traded CO2 allowances in the European Union and Swiss emissions trading systems. Dominique holds a master's degree in finance and strategy, political science, uh, international affairs and governance from the University of St. Gallen and international management for the community of European management schools. Um, from my impressions during his presentation, Dominic is indeed a passionate um, advocate for decarbonization. And in particular, he has done extensive work on, on carbon pricing. He has sent me links to two uh, publications from the World Bank Group on carbon pricing. Uh, and I would ask um, Stefan to please put these links up on the chat so for the benefit of the those in attendance. And without further ado, Dominic, let me invite you because I know you have lots to say on this subject. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thanks a lot, Adrian. And, and it's my pleasure to be here. And I'm, I'm asking the question, how can't you be excited um, <laughs> about decarbonizing maritime transport? So let me quickly share my screen. Mm -hmm.
All right. There we are. Let me take on a ride. Today, as Adrian has already um, introduced, I would like to talk about carbon pricing and international shipping. I'm also going to go a little bit here and there, touching on other topics, the fuel topic and so on, but I'm mostly going to build on uh, what Jan has already alluded to in terms of why we need a carbon price and how it could um, look like. So the idea is really how to put a carbon price on shipping emissions and how to enable an effective and equitable energy transition in shipping. Um, uh, once I'm done, I hope that you can take these three key messages uh, with you. The first, that really carbon pricing is expected to be a key policy to decarbonize maritime transport. Second, that it can not only reduce greenhouse gas, um, uh, greenhouse gas emissions cost effectively, but also raise helpful revenues, which can enable further action. And ultimately, that the strategic use of carbon revenues can address both climate and equity considerations. I'm going to go into the details now what I mean about, um, uh, about all of these key messages. That's the journey that I would like to take you on. Um, uh, it's the what, why, and how journey. So what you need to know about carbon pricing in the IMO greenhouse gas strategy, why it is impo important to think about the strategic use of the carbon revenues, and how you could imagine a potential revenue distribution framework um, uh, moving forward. Let's start with the what. Once again, Jan has already um, outlined this to a certain extent. Um, shipping emissions have been uh, um, on the rise. Uh, for me, also not a big surprise, but some people um, apparently kind of for, for them, it came as a shock. And it gets even worse. Um, with increasing transport demand and uh, forecasts nowadays under greenhouse gas, um, uh, under a business as usual scenario, we are uh, Shipping emissions can be uh, expected to rise further. They're not going to rise proportionally to uh, um, uh, transport demand thanks to increasing energy efficiency, but they will still continue um, uh, to grow. So what we really need to do, uh, to do is um, uh, we need to bring them down to zero, and this is what the International Maritime Organization has committed to, uh, down to zero by and around uh, 2050. And there are two things that we need, not only energy efficiency alone, but we need maximum energy efficiency, and we need these zero carbon bunker fuels moving forward. And I would like to make a small excursion here because Jan, Jan has unfortunately prompted me, and I have to, um, I have to talk about the future green fuels and about uh, LNG as well, because it's so relevant in the context of Trinidad and Tobago. But before we get there, um, just for everybody to understand, in uh, April um, uh, 2018, the IMO greenhouse gas strategy, the initial one was adopted. And it's just four months ago, this was in June 2023, or I'm, I'm currently, um, um, or it was in July, apologies, in July 2023, that the revised uh, IMO greenhouse gas strategy was agreed upon by all 175 um, IMO member sta states, including Trinidad and Tobago. So um, uh, the World Bank, and I've posted this in the chat, the World Bank two years ago, we did some research about what are, what are, what are going to be the future fuels that are going to decarbonize the sector at large scale. And we looked at biofuels, we looked at hydrogen and ammonia, and we looked at synthetic carbon-based fuels. And we assessed them against all different technical, safety, environmental, economic, whatever criteria you could imagine. And we came to the conclusion that most likely um, the biofuels, the sustainable biofuels are going to be limited in supply. The best chances that we have to decarbonize the sector are with hydrogen and ammonia. Um, and um, also to a certain extent, some synthetic carbon-based fuels. And here, it's, uh, especially we are talking about hydrogen, but because hydrogen doesn't have such a big um, energy density, we are most likely going to talk about green ammonia or about um, uh, green methanol uh, moving forward. But the important thing here really to keep in mind is that it is green hydrogen um, or hydrogen in general that is going to be needed as a key um, requisite, uh, prerequisite really to produce um, uh, these uh, green fuels moving forward. Sorry, but I have to talk briefly about uh, liquefied natural gas. Um, uh, please um, um, bear with me. We also looked at li liquefied natural gas, and we were wondering to what extent can liquefied natural gas contribute to shipping decarbonization. 
And there is clearly, there's a strong case to make for liquefied natural gas in terms of air quality. It comes with a lot of air quality benefits. But there is a controversial case um, uh, what the greenhouse gas benefits are of liquefied natural gas, um, LNG. And we looked at three different potential use cases that could be there for, um, um, or three different roles that could be there for LNG um, uh, in uh, shipping. The first one is really that there is a tra transitional role for, for um, uh, liquefied natural gas. And we are very doubtful about this transitional role because it would mean that you have in the beginning um, uh, fossil, liquid, fossil LNG, fossil liquefied natural gas, and then moving forward, you're going to have synthetic liquefied natural gas or you're going to have um, bio, uh, bio LNG. The issue that um, uh, we see there, so, uh, though, is that um, uh, it's the same issue with the biofuels. There's going to be very, very limited amount of sustainable biomass available, and most likely there's going to be other sectors, such as the aviation sector, that has got a higher um, willingness to pay and therefore is going to compete heavily with the with the shipping sector for um, for bio LNG, and with synthetic um, LNG kind of produced based on hydrogen, the problem is that a lot of the infrastructure that would now be built up for, for liquefied natural gas can't be reused in the future for the other fuels that I, that I mentioned, like, um, uh, like particularly ammonia, because it needs different infrastructure. Uh, structure. Therefore, we think there, is, there isn't really a transitional role for, for LNG. We also looked into the temporary role for, um, for LNG and say, okay, let's assume we now, the next 10 years, we're going to use LNG until 2030, and then afterwards we scrap everything and we move completely to ammonia and, and to methanol. However, the big problem, we calculated the greenhouse gas emissions, and the big, big problem of liquefied natural gas is um, the issue of methane leakage. Upstream, when it gets extracted, um, uh, midstream, when it gets distributed, and downstream, when it gets combusted in uh, shipping engines, for instance. And um, uh, liquefied natural gas is basically methane and therefore has got a much, much higher global warming potential than, uh, um, uh, than, uh, than heavy fuel oil. And we, uh, we, did, um, uh, we did the calculations and we came to the conclusion that in the very, very best case scenarios, if all ships, um, all new build ships kind of run on LNG moving forward, we've got, uh, we can reduce um, emissions by um, minus 8%. But in the worst case scenario, if we take more conservative assumptions, emissions are even going to increase by 9% because some parts of the methane are actually not going to be uh, properly combusted in the engine, but get lost on the way, get into the atm atmosphere and therefore contribute um, uh, to global climate change. We also discuss a lot of economic and financial and political and technological issues um, that we see also with a temporary role for LNG. And therefore, we are also very doubtful about the temporary role for LNG. And that leads us to the conclusion that there's likely going to be a limited role for LNG um, in shipping decarbonization only. There can be some niche applications, maybe in some cruise ships where air quality is particularly important, maybe, maybe on some routes where um, LNG terminals exist already, but using it as a large-scale fuel to decarbonize the sector is probably um, a dead end. Just very quickly here, we think if LNG or if natural gas has any future at all, maybe it's not as a propulsion fuel, but more as a, a fuel feedstock to produce, as I said, hydrogen and ammonia to produce carbon-based synthetic fuels, and then do it in the blue way, so uh, not based on renewable energy, but with natural gas and carbon capture and storage, although not sure if this is going to be um, cost competitive in all cases. Okay, that was just a quick kind of country-specific um, excursion. Let's go back to the IMO and to its greenhouse gas strategy. You see the photos here from July 2023, adoption of the uh, 2023 greenhouse gas strategy. Everybody happy, everybody great, uh, everybody um, uh, satisfied, but now the, um, the devil is in the detail. So moving forward, um, you see here that the IMO greenhouse gas strategy um, uh, agreed on uh, so-called candidate midterm greenhouse gas reduction me measures. And these candidate midterm greenhouse gas reduction me measures consist of two major elements. 
It's a technical element, and the technical element can you, you can see here is a marine fuel standard and an economic element. And um, the countries, the IMO member states have agreed this is going to be maritime greenhouse gas emissions pricing moving forward. So the IMO has agreed that there is um, uh, there's going to be carbon pricing moving forward. How exactly that is to be determined? Let me put this into perspective. You see here what short-term measures are supposed to be, mid-term measures, and long-term measures. And when we talk about the mid-term measures, um, we at the World Bank, we focus in particular about a very, very interesting aspect or unique feature that only um, uh, carbon pricing or greenhouse gas emissions pricing, there are different synonyms for this um, offer. And this is they can raise revenues. So, uh, for example, the marine fuel standard um, uh, that I told you about, that is now the technical ele element, um, uh, this is not going um, uh, to raise revenues. However, some uh, um, maritime greenhouse gas emissions pricing options, for example, a carbon levy or a cap and trade system um, uh, without free allocation of allowances, they can re use the revenue, uh, can raise revenues, and these revenues can be used for specific purposes um, that are very, very important in the context of the uh, of the IMO. One major issue. What carbon pricing wants to achieve, or the key objective, is basically it wants to close the competitiveness gap between uh, low sulfur heavy fuel oil here, the black line, and the future fuels, ammonia or methanol, that are um, going to be um, more expensive. Um, uh, the current estimates are, and these are conservative estimates, maybe the picture looks a little bit rosier than this one, but I wanted to be very conservative here, is the, um, um, the current estimates are that uh, yeah, um, ammonia is about six times more expensive, or in this case green ammonia, than, uh, um, than heavy fuel oil, and methanol about 10 times more expensive. This is very conservative, most likely most likely it's going to, uh, going to be less, but I wanted to give you the conservative picture, but these fuels, the costs are also going to uh, go down over time. And the important thing to understand here is really that um, a carbon price basically moves, and this is what Jan Hoffmann had already explained, moves this black line here further up and therefore decreases the cost gap, the competitiveness gap between the fuels that we're going to need and the fuels that are currently being used um, in the sector. The other uh, interesting thing, and this is what I had alluded to, um, is really that um, uh, the strategy, uh, so that carbon pricing, basically when ships pay for their greenhouse gas emissions, for example, $100 per ton of each, uh, each ton of CO2 that they burn, then this raises revenues. This, there, suddenly money becomes available. And um, our estimates are they're based on modeling by the Mass McKinney Mellor Center and based on modeling by University Maritime Advisory Services is that we can probably expect one to um, $3.7 trillion from now until 2050 and about annually, oh, sorry, it should be billion here, apologies for that, 40 to $60 billion um, every single year. That is a lot of money and a lot of money with which you can do a, a, um, a lot of important things and a lot of money that will also be needed as I show to you here. So one to uh, $3.7 trillion. When you look at um, uh, how much money is likely gonna be needed to decarbonize shipping, and this only includes the ship costs and the infrastructure on land to produce um, uh, ammonia in this case and hydrogen and so on. It doesn't even include the renewable energy input yet. Then we are here somehow in the range of 1.4 uh, to $1.9 trillion that are going to be needed really to build all the infrastructure that is needed, uh, that is required to decarbonize uh, the shipping sector. So additional money to finance all this is very, very welcome. Okay. That's my first part. What to know about carbon pricing in the IMO greenhouse gas strategy? Let me now get to my second part. Why is it really important to think about the strategic use of carbon revenues? And I think I've given some cues um, uh, to you already. Um, Jan has also explained this already. Many developing countries, and especially small island developing states, they suffer from what I would call double hardships. They have very often they have got a higher climate vulnerability, so the climate crisis is even more acute um, uh, in their context. 
But at the same time, they also suffer from the highest transport costs um, around the world. And um, this double hardship um, uh, um, uh, also gets reflected into when you think about what are the two main goals that the IMO, uh, IMO wants to pursue or wants to take into account while developing a carbon pricing mechanism. The first thing is obviously maximizing climate outcomes. Maybe not only there is a, there's the uh, principle of the um, highest possible ambition, so not only in shipping, but all around the world. Kind of in the end, it doesn't matter where we where we um, uh, decrease the greenhouse gas emissions. We just want to maximize really the climate outcomes, both in mitigation in terms of adaptation with every single uh, with every policy that we introduce or every dollar that we spend. But at the same time, and that is particularly important to the IMO, we want to support an equitable transition. We want to make sure that those countries that struggle more with climate change or struggle more with shipping decarbonization get some kind of support and are being helped um, uh, to achieve the energy transition so that no country ultimately is left behind. How can this be um, achieved? So. Basically, you've got, um, when you think about the importance of an equitable transition, you have to think about two main options how you can basically achieve um, equity. You couldn't either think about exemptions or about the strategic use of carbon revenues. Exemptions would uh, work that way. You have the for example, more developed countries and the less developed countries, and you say, hey, the carbon price, the $100 per ton of CO2, or maybe $200, or maybe $50, it doesn't really matter. That price only gets applied to the more developed countries. It doesn't get applied to the less developed countries because um, they struggle more with the energy transition, they have higher transfer costs, and so on and so on. It's theoretically uh, um, a nice idea, but this is going to be the outcome. This is what shipping companies are going to do. Shipping companies are going to take all their um, new, efficient, modern, safest, and so on ships, and they are going to route them to the more developed countries. They're going to send all their old, less safe, less efficient, um, uh, um, uh, uh, less modern, and so on, more polluting ships. They're going to send them to those countries in this case, the less developed countries where the carbon price is not applied. This is going to create a two-tiered market um, that I think is not in the interest of anybody because just to take the example of the Pacific small island developing states, um, um, they nowadays have already kind of the oldest and the kind of, sorry, uh, sorry pardon my English, but crappiest ships um, in the world. And this picture is not going to change. It's just going to exacerbate um, uh, the situation where less developed countries and SIDS are left with the kind of um, uh, with, with the worst ships here, um, uh, while all the green kind of good, modern, efficient, safe ships and so on are being deployed in the more developed countries. What we think at the World Bank is an alternative and probably um, a better way to address equity is the strategic use of carbon revenues. Think once again about the more developed countries and the less developed countries. And now we say the carbon price gets applied um, uh, uniformly across all these countries, regardless of whether they are more developed or less developed. In this case, um, but in order exactly in order to address equity, we say we take the carbon revenues and we channel them back. We give them back uh, maybe a little bit to the more developed countries and maybe um, a lot to the less developed countries. In this case, the shipping companies suddenly have no incentive anymore to game the system and, um, uh, and will deploy their, their ships um, uh, more or less equally um, uh, across the globe. So therefore, we really think that um, carbon revenues or using carbon revenues is, um, is a superior option to uh, exemptions to address um, equity and um, legitimate equity concerns by countries. What we did then in our analysis, we looked at um, seven different potential revenue users, um, really starting here from the beginning, from financing in-sector um, uh, climate change mitigation, then going into enhancing maritime transport infrastructure and capacity more broadly, financing broader climate aims. This is also goes outside of the sector, development aims, the general fiscal budget, so you give them, um, uh, money to countries and you don't earmark it at all, and uh, ultimately administrative uh, and enforcement costs. The important thing here to understand is 
that um, uh, uh, these three here would be uh, the money would be used would be uh, um, given back to the sector to the shipping sector and the other ones um, are rather out of sector uses we then took these uh, seven revenue use options and we compared them we assessed them against um, uh, the guiding principles under the IMO greenhouse gas strategy. And there are uh, um, uh, guiding principles that you, you may know from the Paris Agreement, which is the common but differentiated responsibilities and respective cap uh, capabilities. It's all their discussion about dispro disproportionately negative impact. It's the polluter pace principle that Jan has already um, explained, and it's the highest possible climate um, uh, ambition. On top of this, we also um, assess them against some additional key features that we think are desirable. We want to have as many climate benefits as possible. We want to have development benefits, as many as possible. Um, some people say, yeah, we don't want to uh, um, actively need, uh, uh, oh, to, we don't want to uh, um, uh, actively manage all these funds and so on. There should be a more or less like a passive use, kind of something that gets redistributed automatically. And ultimately, also important is, of course, the political feasibility, the industry perspective. And what we came to the conclusion that these three in the middle, so the in-sector mitigation, the maritime infrastructure, and the climate aims, are those that are the most aligned with the guiding principles and the selected desirable key features. It is important to note that each of these revenue uses, each of the, of the rings, has got its own unique value proposition. The question is then, in the end, what, uh, what you prioritize. But we think that these are the three ones that should be prioritized because when you look at um, uh, when you look at our um, assessment, you will see that they score the highest against all the different assessment criteria that we applied. And we also think that, um, and that's a controversial case at the IMO. We also think that it makes sense to consider using the money in the sector, but also out, uh, outside of the sector, because we think there are actually synergies that can be pursued. For example, if you use it within the sector, um, uh, and you, um, uh, for example, you develop zero carbon vessels and zero carbon bunker fuel supply, I'm just thinking about um, uh, in Trinidad and Tobago, this would be green methanol production, for example, in, green, uh, in Trinidad and Tobago, that could be financed. And um, obviously, you will need um, uh, renewable energy uh, for this, maybe offshore wind, maybe, uh, maybe, maybe onshore solar power and so on. And ultimately, when you, uh, when you um, uh, develop this, you can create a win-win situation where the country does not only kind of decarbonize its maritime sector, but also decarbonize, uh, decarbonizes its wider grid um, or the, the power sector um, more broadly. So let me just wrap up the second part and then go um, into my third part. Just very quickly, we think that the strategic revenue use is more suitable for equity than uh, um, the exemptions. Um, uh, we also think that there, um, uh, we have also found out that there is a different alignment between the guiding principles and the desirable key features, but we think that there are three revenue uses that are particularly uh, suitable to be um, uh, pursued. We think there is a strong case for a parallel in-sector and out-of-sector use at the moment because there are synergies that can be exploited. And I haven't spoken about this, but um, uh, we also think that governments are make for the better um, recipients uh, of these revenues than the private sector. The private sector can be complementary, but governments should be the primary recipient because ultimately we want to help IMO member states. And the big problem um, is if you give the money to the private sector, you know it kind of the ship is flying the flag of whatever Liberia. The crew is from the Philippines. The, uh, the ship owner sits in the United States, but it has actually the German citizenship and so on. So who is actually the IMO member said in the end that is going to benefit if he or she um, uh, then gets these revenues. Okay, second part, third part, and then you are done with me. Um, uh, how? So how could we imagine a potential carbon revenue distribution framework um, uh, uh, at the IMO? We've also thought about this and came up, I, we hope, with a, with a kind of viable and, and sensible uh, solution. Let me just quickly talk about here, once again, the, um, um, the three uh, carbon revenue options, uh, use options that we uh, consider most um, suitable. It is the really kind of spending and not shipping, sorry, decarbonization. 
It is um, uh, spending, and, uh, spending the money on maritime transport infrastructure and capacity, but ultimately also spending it on broader climate aims in a country. The first two ones are within the maritime transport sector. The second one would go beyond maritime transport. This can be for mitigation. This could be in the context from Trinidad and um, uh, Tobago, uh, for example, kind of uh, uh, decarbonizing the agricultural sector or other industries uh, and so on and so on. But it could also help with coastal erosion. If Trinidad and Tobago say, uh, for example, coastal erosion is our prime um, uh, a prime adaptation measure that that we want to pursue in order to uh, protect ourselves against climate change. Just here, uh, once again, giving you the uh, um, uh, the, uh, the example. So when we talk about shipping decarbonization, um, that's mostly about fleet upgrades, fleet year renewal, the uh, the whole kind of bunker fuel infrastructure, ammonia, methanol that I spoke about, green ammonia and methanol. In transport infrastructure and capacity, um, um, it's um, uh, it's really kind of building better terminals, being uh, building new terminals, upgrading the ports, but also doing capacity enhancement. Um, there's a lot uh, that can be done in terms of logistics, and here the benefit is really kind of to help keep transport costs low, because with a carbon price, these kind of transport costs are going are gonna to increase. However, if we increase the efficiency in the ports, we can help them to contain that increase to a certain extent. And ultimately, the broader climate aims, um, here the climate change mitigation, as I said, kind of can be in agriculture, can be in industry, um, whatever you want to imagine, um, or uh, also think about climate change adaptation. Okay. Yeah, very, very briefly on this, three questions that we uh, were considering. Should carbon revenues only be spent on maritime transport? I think you have understood by, uh, by now, not necessary, not only. Which country gr groups could have access to the carbon revenues? Um, uh, our key conclusion is really that primarily developing countries and primarily sits and least, uh, so small island developing states and least developed countries, because they will they struggle the most with climate change and with shipping decarbonization. Uh, decarbonization. And the last thing here, so how could the possible revenue distribution framework look like? And we've tried to develop one that is based on three levers. The first lever is the recipient lever. So where we say, okay, we, uh, we um, uh, develop three windows, or they are called here share A, share B, and share C. And within these three windows, we say different recipients have got access to these windows. So um, the selected developing countries, so especially the SIDS and LDCs, would basically have access to window one, to share B as well, and to share C. However, the developing countries only have got access, the other developing countries, to share B and C. And ultimately, the developed countries um, uh, um, alone, they would have access to share C only. And that is important to understand when you go into the second lever, which is the use lever. Uh, once again, reminding you of the three uses, shipping decarbonization, maritime transport infrastructure, and capacity enhancements more, more widely, or broader climate aims. Here it is that we think that it makes sense to give the SITs and LDCs that have got share, um, uh, access to uh, um, share A um, uh, the possibility to use the money for all of these um, three use options. Why is this the case? Because we looked into it and we found that among the SITs and the LDCs, there are a couple of countries. For example, uh, the obvious example is um, uh, landlocked countries. If you restrict that, uh, if you restrict the revenue use to shipping decarbonization or to maritime transport infrastructure and capacity, what are the landlocked countries going to do with the money? They have no shipping. They have no maritime transport infrastructure and capacity. But they also suffer from the, from the increasing um, uh, costs in, uh, in uh, uh, shipping due to, um, due to um, a carbon price. So they should be allowed to spend it on broader climate aims as well. The same applies to some SITs. Obviously, the SITs have got um, ships and ports by, uh, by default. However, some of them are so small um, uh, and have only whatever two ports or five ports or so, and it doesn't make sense to uh, pour a lot, a lot, a lot of money in, um, uh, uh, in this infrastructure because it's simply not needed. However, they would need the money for whatever mangroves um, uh, or any other um, 
as I said, agricultural activities much more often, then they should uh, much more um, much more urgently they should be given the possibility um, uh, to do so. Under Share B, if the countries can show that they actually uh, kind of cannot spend it on shipping decarbonization alone. This should also be opened, but under Share C, where uh, developing, uh, developed countries alone, uh, or they, it's the only share that the developed countries have got access to, this should be really restrict and be restricted to shipping decarbonization because this is the prime goal um, uh, of the IMO that uh, they want to achieve. And ultimately, there's a third lever where we also would like to introduce some uh, differentiation. So here it's about the financing terms, the financing terms lever. Where you can you can um, uh, make the financing terms either relatively relaxed or relatively stringent. Relatively stringent would be, for instance, that you give loans, kind of maybe, um, uh, and the loans need to be paid back and so on, and maybe depending on the interest rate. Uh, but ultimately, uh, the fund that is going to distribute um, uh, these revenues is going to get the money back from the countries. Relaxed would be really grants where you say where you say kind of hey if a SIT um, or an LDC applies for that money and wants to get that money they get that money for free to for example spend it on these um, three options that I've outlined. That is the framework that we have um, suggested put forward at the IMO already. There are currently being um, um, uh, many discussions, what can be fine-tuned, what can be tweaked, what may need to be changed. But we think that this is um, uh, the, the first blueprint, the first idea, a proposal really, that serves as a very good basis for discussion. And we are looking forward to continuing our contributions to um, making carbon pricing in shipping and making an equitable um, and effective energy transition in the sector a reality. Once again, the key messages, I hope that you take away that carbon pricing is going to come. It's going to be a key policy to decarbonize maritime transport. I hope that you have understood that it does not only reduce greenhouse gas um, uh, cost effect, greenhouse gases cost effectively by closing the competitiveness gap, but also the fact that it raises rev uh, uh, revenues enables further action. And ultimately, we think that a framework can be designed that um, addresses both climate and equity considerations, the two main goals. Um, uh, uh, equally and therefore kind of benefits um, uh, benefits uh, all this uh, kind of these objectives that we actually want to uh, achieve. Thank you so much. And I hope that I've stayed more or less in time now, more or less. Jan, it's, uh, the, the blame is all on you. Excellent presentation, uh, Dominique. Stefan? Thank you very much, Dominic. Very good presentation. As you know, financing is a major element. I mean, you mentioned figures of 1.4 to 1.9 trillion dollars to transition the, the sector into um a carbon neutral um um well industry. So um this was a very insightful. This is one of the elements that we tend to um not have not been able to focus much on um to date, right? So this presentation again very enlightening. So what I would like to do is open the floor to um any questions that you may have for Dominic. Um take a note of the time. We'll take about of a maximum of two questions for Dominic before we move straight into the um the panel discussion. Again, use the raise hand function. And I'll ask you to unmute yourself and you can you can communicate and ask your question. Presenters, there are a number of questions in the question and answer tab. So I'll also ask you guys to, um, to address as many of these as we possibly can. Depending on how many are left after, um, we will ask the participants to either email us or contact you guys directly with the questions that they may have. Any questions for Dominic? No. Dominic, well, I suppose you you explain that and it is quite a... I've, 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 I think I've, I've shocked everybody and, yeah. and, and <laughs> everybody, everybody has gone, uh, gone to their psychologists now kind of to talk, <laughs> to talk it through. Okay. You did an excellent job, Dominic. I must commend you for breaking it down into manageable sections. So a job well done. Um, 
Stefan, can I go on to introduce sure. our moderator? Okay. Um, let me just say at the outset, I've also invited to join the panel discussion, Professor Clement Imbeer, uh, our chairman. So Gordon now has the task of including uh, in the among the panelists, um, Anas, um, Jan, Dominique, and Professor Imbeer, who has been our focal point in driving decarbonization and alternative renewable energy sources uh, in Trinidad and Tobago. Uh, let me introduce my good friend, Gordon Wimsmeyer. Uh, Gordon is the director of the Hapag Lloyd Center for Shipping and Global Logistics, GSGL, CSGL at the Kuna Logistics University, KLU, uh, which I myself visited in 2016, I think it was in Hamburg, Germany, uh, during the IEME meeting in that year. At the same time, he holds the Kuna Professorial Chair in Logistics at the School of Management at La Universidad de los Andes, Bogota, Colombia. Since October 2020, he has been working with the Vice Presidency for Research and Creation at La Universidad de los Andes from 20, from the 10th month of 2020 um, to 8, 2022. As the Director of the Project Development Office, and since uh, the 10th month of 2022, he is the strategic coordinator of the interdisciplinary research centers of the vice presidency. Gordon is the honorary professor of maritime geography at the University of Applied Sciences in Bremen in Germany. And from 2011 to 2017, he has worked as economic affairs officers, uh, officer in the infrastructure services unit at the United Nations Economic Commission for Latin America and the Caribbean, UN ECLAC in Chile. Previously, he worked at Edinburgh Napier University's Transport Research Institute, TRI, uh, in Scotland from 20, 2007 to 2011. And as a consultant for UN ECLAC, for UNCTAD, for UNOHRLLS, the World Bank, Adelphi Research, JICA, IDB, CAF, and OS. Gordon received his PhD in geography from the University of Osnabrück and graduated um, as a geographer from the Techniques Universität uh, Dresden, Germany. Gordon's research focuses on maritime transport geography and economics, port economics and inland shipping issues. Recent projects focus on port governance, sustainable port development, energy transition, competition in liner shipping services, digitalization and technology in supply chains, as well as nautical electromobility. Uh, he has a research group and they're working on his 2023 project inaugurated the first battery electric school boat on the Pacific coast of Colombia. So electrification of vessels. He has published over 100 book chapters, journal papers, institutional publications and working papers. His recent books include geographies of maritime transport and maritime mobilities. In 2022, his work on climate change adaptation was cited in the IPCC report. He is also the leader of the Global Port Performance Research Network, the PPRN, of which I'm a member, and a council member of the International Association of Maritime, maritime Economists, of which I'm also a member, uh, and he's a member of the WCTRS Special Interest Group in, on Intermodal Freight. And he is an associate member of Port Economics. Since 2020, his research group is part of the IDB's university network on energy hub for Latin America and the Caribbean. Gordon has a number of links to his various publications, which I have asked um, Stefan to put into the chat so that those in attendance can easily access his publications. Now, um, you may recall I mentioned that my relationship with Jan Hoffman goes back over 30 years. So does my relationship with Gordon Wilmsmeyer, uh, who would visit Trinidad and Tobago on ECLAC missions uh, to conduct research here. And not um, without losing any moment, after our hard day's work, I would take him up to Desperado Spaniard in Laventil, where we would um, share a beverage, a cold carib, and listen to some sweet steel pan music. Do you remember those days, Gordon? <laughs> 
Well, yeah, there was a days when I still had hair, I guess. Um, so <laughs> me too. So again, <laughs> welcome to the um, to the role of moderator, and uh, I invite uh, Anas Alamush. I invite Jan Hoffman. I invite Dominic Englert, and of course our chairman Clement Imbert, a professor uh, deeply involved in this field as well, uh, to join your panel discussions. The floor is yours. Um, Adrian, thank you very much. Um... Really pleasure to be here. Um, and um, I think we heard um, very interesting and also challenging um, presentations this morning. Um, and I think one message that, that came came very clear to me is the message, I think, both from all of us, we cannot continue what we have done in the past. So how do we take a more radical approach um, to what we are doing? And somehow several mentioned that we have been losing and wasting a lot of time in taking important decisions um, to get on the right pathway um, that we knew for a long time that existed. But the question is, how do we really um, get into that pathway? Um, and so so the first question, really, I, I would like to kind of bring, bring the discussion together again is on this um, we have also a world that is divided and with a lot of uh, geopolitical challenges uh, in, in in recent times. So so it's not that we are all moving in the same direction or at the same speed. So a question to, 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 to the four panelists a little bit. How would you see or which roles did you particularly see for emerging economies? And on the other hand, what are the roles that you see where industrial economies um, should move towards really supporting this decarbonization? Because, I mean, also when we look at Jan's list of who are the flag states, who are the countries suffering, you mentioned that, Jan, you had some examples of that. But the question is, we really need to change also how these decisions are being taken and how countries can bring that into action. So what would be concrete ideas to probably change the role and activities and relationships in these two ways. I don't know who would like to dare to start. Well, I I, I, I can kick off by uh, saying what we have been doing in Trinidad and Tobago. Um, first of all, there's currently uh, a program that should um, start to bear fruit in the first or second quarter of next year, whereby the government and, and some private energy companies are establishing a solar farm of, well, solar farms of 112 megawatts. It doesn't sound very big. Now, Trinidad and Tobago is not very big, but our demand for electricity is pretty high. Um, it's about 14, 1500 megawatts. So this represents about 8% of our demand. Um, so Antibago is aiming to have 30% of its energy by renewable methods um, by 2030. I actually would like to see that accelerated because four more Four more solar projects like what we have would bring us, in fact, to the 30%. And um, I think this question of 2050 carbon zero has really, that 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 timeline has to be reduced because of what we are, have been seeing in the last two years, particularly. Um, too much rain in some areas, no rain in some areas. Um, the, the, whole, the whole change of the weather patterns and so on. And of course, this year, the extreme heat that has been experienced all over the world. Um, mm -hmm. I see men using umbrellas. I never saw men using umbrellas in the, in the streets before, but I have been seeing it recently. Um, so that is what is, is happening at the moment in terms of, of renewables. I, I think um, we have to ramp it up, as I say. The second um, major project, major in, 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 in our context, in terms of size, is a project again funded by the government and by oil companies. Um, 
in carbon capture and storage. There have been there has been a project that has been uh, going on for the last eighteen months or so, and it's going quite well. And the government and the companies have decided to extend it. So looking at you now the carbon capture, um, some so some studies have been done. The, the baseline studies have been done as to which areas we have to carbon, uh, capture carbon. And some plants in Trinidad and Tobago, as you know, Trinidad and Tobago is, is, is relatively heavily industrialized for its size and, and, and developing status. Some companies have started to capture the carbon. The issue now is where do we put it? So we are, there, there is a, an extension of the study now to see some of the, the oil wells, um, the land-based oil wells, we had a number of land-based oil wells. We do have a land, number of land-based oil, oil wells. Most have been capped in, in Trinidad. Um, so that the, the reservoir engineering and the wire lining and the, 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 the data is being collected to see how we can use the, the carbon to store it in some of these wells. Um, also use it for some um, enhanced oil recovery and so on. So from the point of view of, as I say, from our size and uh, and, and so on, Toronto Tobago is, is doing quite a lot. And we need to, because of our uh, heavy industrialization for such a small country, we are very high up per capita in terms of emissions, very high up per capita. So. Although in absolute terms, we are not contributing a large amount to the global emissions per capita mm -hmm. we are. So we owe it to, the, to the, the green agenda to do as much as we can in, in those both areas. Because I think carbon capture will have to, in the interim, will have to, and I'll say what I mean by the interim, will have to play a very important part in the, the decarbonization. Okay, thank you, thank, 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 thank you, Clement. I, I, we yes. would like to give time to us. Yeah, yeah. Dominic, no, no. Dominic, I see, I see your hand as well. Yeah, no, thank, yes, thank you so much. Um, uh, good question. Um, unfortunately, I don't have the silver bullet either, but I would like to try to break it down a little bit. If we think about what can different countries do and what can we do for them? And then if we think about the really the, the highly developed, high income countries and so on, mm -hmm. if we think about the emerging economies, developing countries somewhere in between, and then often the least developed countries and many small island developing states um, as, a, as a third group, I think for the, for the developed countries, I mean, it is first uh, important that I think we are there by now that at the International Maritime Organization, that they accept and that they foster and that they support a policy that includes um, uh, equity and that really incorporates this idea that we have to support the rest of the world um, uh, in decarbonizing shipping. And that also means financial support. And, but I really think that we are there now and that this is, this is um, uh, moving forward. Then they also have to, um, and it's in their own interest, they have to work with the emerging economies, and they are doing this already, because they know um, or, uh, they don't know now already. Maybe the United States have got enough resource potential. Maybe um, other um, major countries, Canada, for example, has also enough uh, renewable energy potential. But a lot of um, uh, countries um, around the world, in Europe, um, uh, um, Japan, and Korea. They know already that they will be dependent on uh, energy imports, green energy imports from emerging economies. And a lot of these emerging um, and therefore work with them and really kind of offer offtake agreements, um, uh, provide incentives uh, really to make investments in these countries because ultimately they will benefit from this and get the, the green energy that they ur urgently need to decarbonize. Um, uh, their, their industry. And then ultimately, it's also leading by example, um, really all that is your own kind of public shipping, be it the Coast Guard, be it kind of whatever tugboats that you own yourself uh, or anything like this. I mean, really lead by example and make sure that these run on the green fuels moving forward. Just very quickly, and this um, also answers some of the questions uh, asked in the Q&A, what do emerging economies, some developing countries, 
I would say, really, look into this. It's a, it's a challenge, but it's also a big, big opportunity. And the World Bank, in Latin, I, I'm just giving the, the Latin American example now. We've received requests from Colombia, from Panama, from Brazil, um, Chile. These are all countries with whom we work already on um, uh, exploiting, leveraging, and taking advantage of their green fuel production potential. They've got great resources. They, they often have got great um, uh, um, shipping locations. And therefore, um, uh, it really makes sense for these governments uh, to reach out to the World Bank and ask for support. I've seen there's one question regarding Peru. Why haven't we worked on Peru yet? We haven't received a request to work on Peru yet. So as soon as Peru reaches out to us and says, hey, we want to we wanna look into our potential. Can we do something? The same for Trinidad and Tobago. Um, uh, let, let the World Bank know, and then the World Bank needs to act and needs to see how we can with support. And now the uh, third group, and then I'm, I'm over, um, uh, for uh, least developed countries and, and small island developing states, yes, not all of them will kind of have major um, uh, business opportunities and development opportunities there. Some of them are too small. Some of them um, struggling with many, many other issues. They need the support from, for example, such a market-based measure mechanism, a carbon pricing mechanism at the IMO that really helps them with money, that helps them with capacity building and so on to, um, uh, to handle and to, uh, uh, to make sure that they also move forward in shipping decarbonization and are not, uh, are not left behind. That's it. Thanks. Dominic, Dom, Jan, you, no, you, you're reacting, so that's good. No. Good. Uh, thank you. Uh... Uh, Professor Lims, allow me to share two slides. Uh, whether or not you allow me, I will just share them. Um, Thank yeah. you. <laughs> it's the floor is yours. <laughs> um, I hope you can see this uh, distribution. We, different terms have been used. Um, developing, developed, industrialized, uh, emerging, middle income, low income, it's it's really difficult. It's not black and white, of course. It is distribution. So I don't know whether you have seen this type of distribution of, of income, whether it sounds familiar or not. Uh, uh, that's at least what I learned when I went to school, that there's the North and the South, and the North has the jobs, and the South has the raw materials. And the result is this type of income distribution, a, a big number of poor people, on the left and a smaller number of, of rich people. And of course, if you multiply the income per capita with the people, then the right side has the money to help the left side. Does anybody have seen this type of graph that sounds familiar? Well, that was 1975. Yeah. And that was when we had not seen the growth in Korea and China and Indonesia and Malaysia and so on and so forth. Today, or relatively today, it looks like this. We no longer have this easy division of the world into two basic groups, the rich and the poor. It's much, much more complicated. So in the middle, you have the emerging economies you do see a little bump on the left. So I, so for us in UNCTAD, the UN in Geneva, the unit of counting is not so much the human being, but the country, the government, the member. So I try to replicate this picture. This was the picture 1970, and I counted the number of countries per GDP. And you do see again this gap. You see on the right side, a small number of what is it, 35 rich countries, and on the left, the large number of poorer countries. And again, if you update this today, this gap is gone. It's more enormous, but to the left, you have a lot of poor. So uh, this is not to give an answer to Gordon's question, it's to make our life more complicated and say it's no longer that easy that the rich help the poor, but uh, there are some that are really very poor on the left, and the there has been progress. I, I'm I'm there with Gapminder or Steven Pinker or Bill Gates. I I'm optimistic things have improved, which is why now also a lot of the so-called emerging economies are ready.
to pay for the CO2 they're emitting, but there are still some very poor, very small countries that, that need support. I, I think, I think Jan, you, you, you make an important point here because <clears throat> um, it also, I mean, what, what a lot of um, thoughts we have is we, we are really in a multipolar world today as well, right? In, in different ways, um, if it's a political, but also an income. And, and so, so the old um, um, approaches um, don't necessarily work anymore because we also have a lot of um, possible um, financing that is actually coming from countries that were traditionally uh, referred to emerging economies and they also invest um, in these technologies and and i think there are huge opportunities now particularly when it comes to shipping and maybe to, to get anna's um, um involved here a little bit i mean yes we have and, and dominic referred to that we have um, a lot of opportunities in, in countries that are not traditionally providers of energy, of the traditional fossil fuel energies, that they now participate in the alternative fuels. Now, Anas, um, what would you propose if we would argue that um, Trinidad and Tobago and um, Peru are the bunkering hubs of the world and we will reduce Rotterdam to a small local national provider in terms of bunkering. So how do we um, manage that? What would be the reaction in Rotterdam? How do we get Rotterdam to maybe support bunkering infrastructure that would really help or, or take place in, in these countries that were traditionally not part of this? Uh, thank you very much, Professor. I, I believe uh, uh, we as developing countries, we, we did a recent study about uh, all the memorandums for the green shipping corridors, which engage, engage the, the, the bunkering of uh, future alternative fuels, uh, the ammonia or electric fuels, uh, etc. And we found out that most of the those uh, memorandums, are, yes, they are not yet operational, but they prepare for the future uh, bunkering of, of, of alternative fuels. Most of them do, do, done in emerging economies and developed countries. And here is the chance for us in developing countries, particularly Trinidad and Tobago, Tobago or, or other countries, to engage in the green shipping corridors and by establishing memorandums with other uh, countries, other ports, to engage in the production uh, of alternative fuels. Uh, by starting this, we get far away from the chicken and egg things and start doing something uh, uh, for, for the, the industry and doing the, the what is required, learning from uh, uh, ports advancing uh, in this, uh, such as Rotterdam, etc. That's my point of view, is that we, we start uh, by at least doing the memorandums, uh, start uh, planning and uh, engaging in that business as by itself is a start. Mm -hmm. So So then... Um, there was also Dominic said about the, the, the national fleet, think about the national fleets and converting the national fleets where you can do the, um, all, all, already the transition. I mean, I think we, we a lot of times and talk about the big ships, right? Or we talk about decarbonization of shipping and we are thinking about 20,000 TU vessels or, or bulk ships, but actually, the shipping market is much bigger. So we have already hydrogen tugs in ports that are operating, right? We have electric tugs that are operating. Um, recently, um, Uruguay ordered an uh, electric catamaran, um, battery electric catamaran with a capacity of 2,100 passengers, uh, right? That's going to start hopefully operating 2026. So if we think a little bit more about the diversity of um, the shipping industry, not only the big ships um, that we like so much. Um, th there are more niches, and Dominic referred to that in, in the national context. Um, so, so where are these low-hanging fruits maybe on the more national or local um, shipping? Dominic, I don't know if that why you raised your hand or you want to answer to that. Or... But... No, I was, I was just wondering, um, uh... On the on the local shipping, I mean, there there was an interesting report I think one or two years ago, uh, ago by the Global Maritime Forum. Uh, it's called Closing the Gap Report, and they were investigating what kind of ship types um, are most likely 
going to contribute the most to the the IMO has got 5% uh, green fuels um, striving for 10% by 2030 target. So how can we get these 5 or um, 30%? Uh, 5 or 10%, apologies. I'm, I'm more ambitious. I'm always, I, I would like to see 30%, obviously, but um, it's only 5 to 10. Okay, so what what are these ship types? Um, um, it is very, very uh, um, easy. It is already uh, um, ammonia carriers and maybe to a certain extent also methanol carriers because like LNG, for them it's the easiest to just burn their cargo as well. Um, they, carry, they carry the substance, they carry the fuel anyways. The second one are container ships. Um, uh, the container ships because it is, it is much easier I just give an example. It's much easier to uh, um, pass through the the additional cost of an iPhone or um, a, a laptop or fancy clothing or whatever jeans that goes, for example, um, uh, to the United States to pass this through to the end consumer than pass it through um, uh, on um, a bag of rice um, or so, where where this kind of staple food small increases in transport costs are going to already have a much, much bigger, um, make a much bigger difference in the end consumer price. Um, and the third thing is really is the public fleet. But I would like to caveat this a little bit, especially in the developed um, uh, developed countries. I don't want to say that we don't need to do this um, uh, uh, in the developing countries uh, too. But if the developed countries that really want to drive this and want to lead by example, this is, exa this is what we call public procurement, green public pro procurement. This is really where they can make a difference and where they can basically um, show the proof of, con uh, of concept and say like, hey, the tugboats, the pilot boats and so on that run on hydrogen that are electrified, so on, they work in the port of Rotterdam or in the port of Hamburg or in the port of Southampton or um, doesn't matter, Le Havre and so on. And that is something that can then be replicated more easily um, uh, across the world. So it's these three ship types, um, uh, uh, as I said, ammonia, methanol carriers, container ships, and then ultimately anything that is the public fleet, primarily in the in the developed countries. Hmm. Yeah, I, I mean, we have a great example, actually, if you think about it, if, if we go to Norway, most of the fares are electrified, right? Yeah. So, and, and this has actually also been a huge possibility for new industrial development. It's not only thinking about decarbonization, but it's also opening new markets uh, and, and new possibilities. Um, um, so so I think there is a huge opportunity, particularly in in this more more local um, shipping industry or inland shipping as well. We have seen, seen significant changes already um, in some parts. And, and, we are, and we are always talking about greenhouse gas emissions here only, but ultimately uh, this decarbonization process is also going to come with air quality benefits. Mm. And that's obviously something that for many cities is uh, particularly important because so many people basically live along the coastline and um, are exposed to um, currently sulfur emission, nitrogen oxides um, uh, and all the other air pollutants. Yeah. I mean, the, the good example in this, what you say is, is Bangkok. Right, the passenger uh, transport also, also ferries uh, within the local system. Uh, they are have started to electrify these, um, and this was emerging actually from the air quality conditions within Bangkok. Uh, that was a basic driver um, behind that, and and so I think we have very good reasons also to to look at those vessels. Um, Jan, any comment on this on the local shipping? Uh, yeah. I... <clears throat> Not so much the local, but again, you mentioned this. It's uh, something we have not discussed, although Trinidad Tobago also sits. Mm -hmm. We are particularly concerned about the Pacific sits who have who are particularly far away. <laughs> and um, it's even more difficult for them to connect to the new and alternative fuels. And, and I really, I, we don't have a, a solution there. It just shows again, it's not just black and white and being part of it or not. Um, well, then it is maybe black and white because the alternative fuels, as, as Dominique, you showed the charts and it was conservative, but but whatever you take, they are two to four times less energy dense. Yeah, So you need to transport two to four times more volume in your tank on the ship to transport the same energy. Mm -hmm. Already today, you go to Kiddie Barge or 
far away, Pitcane Islands, whatever, you already have to carry your own fuel most of the time. And if you're lucky, some of the islands, they provide bunkering for the return fuel. Now in future, they have to provide not one fuel, but two, three, maybe four fuels. These are two to four times more voluminous. And it, there is a real danger that more islands than in the past will simply not be included in the network. They, they will simply skip, be skipped. No? So apart from this, which I, I actually, I, I should have said this earlier, when I said I showed this graph, the supply curve, yes, there will be slight increase and so on. But for some cases, the slight increase is more than a slight increase and it may make them be kicked off. So you mentioned positive examples in Uruguay, short distance, coastal, in Bangkok, the passenger. Yes, you can electrify, you can do many things. But our concern are those where you cannot do, do the solution. And it's really just to raise again this, this concern why we are in favor of an economic measure, because the only way to somehow compensate for this is, is it will be some sort of subsidy to, to avoid this falling off the cliff situation. Mm -hmm. There's a direct reaction from Dominic. Yeah, yeah. very, very quickly. Um, uh, Jan has alluded to this. So, so the energy density of the new fuels is a problem. So you basically, you, you have to sacrifice, you can either go only a, a shorter distance or you have to sacrifice some cargo space. Both is not, uh, both is not ideal. However, this means that local shipping can be a little bit more appropriate to uh, adopt hydrogen or ammonia um, uh, um, or methanol. In most cases, I mean, just look at the Caribbean, yeah, kind of the distances are relatively manageable. Mm -hmm. However, there are then outliers, as Jan has said, the Pacific sits, unfortunately, are not as bunched, and therefore <coughs> they have to cover distances that for, for um, which which are basically deep sea shipping, long distance shipping for many other countries around the world. Yeah, and there <laughs> it gets trickier. Um, uh, and, and yeah, yeah, I think the 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 economic measures um are very, very important that we take them. I mean, the the and we we call them now a carbon levy, but in, in the end, it's an old discussion. Right? We never internalized external costs. We just ignored it basically. And um, hailed um, the cheap transport costs. Um, yeah. um, we love and... shipping, and we say also the shipping. Uh, we don't want to move things by other modes of transport instead. And that's another little discussion. We still have this this one minute. We haven't yet discussed mm -hmm. it. And and I know that people in the IMO and Dominique and Trista and others said, no, no, let's not touch the the modal shift. But even if only very, very, very small part of shipping moves to air instead of shipping, emissions go up. Eh? So, so we want to avoid this. <laughs> um, now, air transport, of course, also has to decouple, also has to internalize. No, and and this internalization externalities, this the pay the total cost. All previous transitions in shipping, from from rowing to sail, from sail to coal, from uh, no, first to, yeah, from sale and then to coal, from coal to oil, they were self-funded because the new technology was more energy efficient. So it was commercially, it makes sense to move from coal to oil and so on. The next transition is only self-funded if we manage to include all costs. There's an organization in the UK that's called True Costs. They had some nice papers about the total true costs of shipping with ship scrapping and pollution and emissions and so on. So this, I think, is the real challenge. Without this charging the true cost, the energy transition will not fund itself. Mm -hmm. uh, and as, um, you also raised your hand. I would like to thank the interventions by uh, Dominic and uh... Uh, Professor Hartman, but I want to go back to your uh, first comment about ships that are not covered by the IMO regulations. And we, we did a study uh, last uh, year about those those ships, and they they, they, they emit around 1% of world share. And those we, we want this year that we don't want, we need not to forget about those shippings 
especially ships under 400 gross tonnage or the uh, super yachts uh, under 5,000 gross tonnage, domestic ships and short sea shipping, inland waterway shipping, uh, barge and tugs, pleasure ports and yachts, and fishing vessels. Those are not included in the discussion, and it's very important to to, to think also uh, as from the port side or the shipping side, how to facilitate the, 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 those uh, shipping de decarbonization. There are many examples here, uh, you mentioned in Norway and even in Sweden between uh, uh, the Sweden and Denmark, uh, total electric, electric uh, ferries electrified. And uh, in Belgium as well, Antwerp, uh, the they, 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 they tugs start working in hydrogen, etc. Mm -hmm. Yeah, um, with, with, the, with the probability that, that Adrian um, is going to kick us out soon, yeah, um, of this, um, because I think there's a lot, lot of discussion about it. Also, also Jan, um, what, what you said about um, the the different, um, yeah, transitions towards more, more efficiency. Um, now, um, probably... Um, and another issue is of this true cost or just transition is also not only the environment we talked about here, but it's also the social part um, and the social costs that are involved in this. We should not forget about this as well, which all. Make part of and social part of sustainability of the sustainability discussion, they're very relevant. And we cannot then limit the sustainability discussion to only the, the emissions. Um, I think that is very important that we keep that in mind um, in these discussions. Yeah. So the, um, the, the seafarers, I know we are almost right about uh, one last raising hand yeah, to yeah, end yeah, on, yeah, a, yeah. On, a, on a positive note before Adrian kicks us out. And I also have to leave. We have three more minutes, I believe. Um, <clears throat> Once we have achieved that transition, the marginal cost of shipping may actually really, really go down huh? because the, the cost of renewable energy has for the last decades gone down year after year after year faster than we had forecasted. The, the capacity of batteries, the marginal cost of solar, wind, and so on. Yes, there are also costs in the cement and it's volatile. I I would also not exclude uh, nuclear, certain nuclear solutions in the longer term future, but our great grandchildren will probably, hopefully and probably see ships going at 30 knots with very, very low energy costs because we will have found ways to do the power to X to convert solar, wind, other, other renewable to something that, that's the difficulty to get this renewable where the costs go down to get this transportable on the ships. So I wanted to add in, on, on a positive note that once after we have gone through this somewhat costly transition, um, the, the cost of shipping, of trade, of maritime transport, which we all love, will again be lower than today. Okay. Um, well, so I don't know. I, I think I would like to Joe, I know Jan, you have to leave in one minute, but so this was your last statement. So I'll give each of the panelists one more minute to make like a final statement. What should be the main takeaway from today in terms of actions for the future? So maybe uh, we start with you, Clement. Yes. So I would um three quick points. The major polluters must do much more in terms of decarbonization across the board, not just in ship. They are the ones responsible for what is happening today, and they have to do much more in terms of decarbonization. One, they also have to ramp up more of renewable energy use. Um, and that's connected, of course. And thirdly, I would like to see the World Bank, UNCTAD and other UN agencies, they are, they are the world agencies, expand Dominic's principles from shipping to the entire uh, sphere of transportation, manufacturing, etc., to ensure, as you say, the carbon revenues, the carbon tax, if you like, and equity. 
those are the, my closing words. Sorry I took so long. No, no, it was perfect. One minute. Thanks, Levin. Uh, Anas. And thank you very much for giving the, the space to say our, our final message. Um, my final message is that we, we as ports uh, need also to play a role in uh, decarbonization by decarbonization themselves, uh, becoming energy hub and also facilitating the shipping decarbonization. We, uh, in this uh, uh, pursuit for the decarbonization uh, in terms of mitigation, we should not forget also adaptation uh, and building uh, resilient cities, especially and uh, protecting agriculture and the uh, uh, trade in, in uh, small and developing island states or developing countries that will be impacted the most. Thank you, Anas. Dominic. Yeah, um, uh, I think my main key message would be that there, way too often we focus on the challenges only, and the challenge is the higher transport costs and so on, and the technology uh, issues and all that stuff. But at the same time, uh, we don't take the opportunities enough into account. Um, opportunities, I'm talking about um, air pollution, for instance. I'm talking also about all the business opportunities we set in the green fuel production for many, many countries, and Jan mentioned this, uh, that didn't have the chance to participate in the global bunker fuel market for decades. Now, for the first time, they have a part to be to become a, um, a player there. And at the same time, also something that uh, for the shipping sector as a whole, what I always try to explain to my colleagues here internally at the World Bank as well is, if you think about, if you don't think at all, shipping is not going to run on uh, on ammonia and methanol moving forward. No, absolutely, shipping is not going to decarbonize because we are all bad people and we don't believe in climate change and nothing is going to happen at the international level and so on. But as long as all the other sectors decarbonize, heavy industries, fertilizer, um, aviation, and so on. They will need these green fuels. They will need green hydrogen. And this green hydrogen will get produced in Latin America and will get produced in Africa and will get produced in East Asia and so on. And it somehow needs to find its way to Europe, for example. And we will not see that many, uh, uh, that many pipelines there. You will need ships to bring it there. So there is an inherent business opportunity for the shipping sector and whether the shipping sector wants it or doesn't want it, it's going to be involved and it's going to be, uh, um, it, it needs to be part of the game. Thank, thank you, Dominic. Um, well, th thanks to, to the four of you. Um, I think we could go on with this discussion for much longer time. Um, um, but I know uh, time is limited for all of us as well. So thanks. Um, in take, taking on this last couple, it, it's really, um, too often, I see we see the negative in this transition. There's so many opportunities we can take, um, and if it's the smallest example, um, we have experienced ourselves with an electric school board in Colombia, where, where some people now go carbon free basically um, to school, to uh, ferries um, in <clears throat> in Norway, or then ammonia carriers. The, there are so many good examples that we can use. So if we focus on those and how we can scale them up, I think we have big opportunities. And the question is really, how can we scale them up? And then maybe this economic rent uh, Jan is talking about and mentioning, this is this is the opportunity to use and, and really start investing in these opportunities. So with this, um, Adrian, I'll give over to you um, to send us back to our desk to read more because you gave us a comprehensive reading list, which I did not expect different. Very good. Thank you, um, Gordon, for moderating an excellent panel discussion. Um, what is left for us to do now is to move a vote of thanks and, um, and to close the proceedings. Um, Stefan, should I proceed into the vote of thanks? Sure, Adrian, go ahead. All right. Um, it's just some quick um housekeeping. We have some um questions here within the chat that the presenters will respond to. We get some time to respond to. You could reach out to them directly through LinkedIn and any other channels. I've seen um Dominic have put in his contact also and provided his contact. We do have a large um catchment here this morning. 
members from Ministry of Public Utilities, um, trans, um, transportation, energy. We have national energy representatives here. That's just to mention some airport authorities. So it is quite a large catchment. So um, we will make the links to the videos available when they are uploaded um, using your registration information and the emails that you provided and the presentations from this morning. Okay, and anything else, you please do feel free to reach out to us. You have my email also. You'll have gotten the confirmation email from me, right? So please feel free to reach out to us at, at the university and at um, the Center for Maritime Studies. Okay, before I move the vote of thanks, let me pass on the opportunity to the chairman of the University of Trinidad and Tobago, who is our champion, and without whose support, we would not have been able to make this webinar possible uh, to reach uh, so many people in Latin America and the Caribbean. I think I counted over 170 participants. So I will invite Professor Clement Imbe to say uh, some final words before I move the vote of thanks. No, no, Adrian, I have said my final words. So okay. <laughs> All right. <laughs> but, but let me let me say um, a great debt of gratitude is owed to the chairman of the University of Trinidad and Tobago, who, as I said, is our champion. He has inspired us. He has supported us. He has guided us along the way. Um, there are many other issues I know he could have discussed, uh, and I know that we'll have room for discussion, certainly between the chairman and um and Dominique Englert in terms of uh, how the World Bank can assist Trinidad and Tobago in furthering its objectives of pursuing decarbonization and alternative renewable energy strategies. Uh, so there's still some work to be done there. Uh, I want to express a great um, a deal of gratitude to the resources within the University of Trinidad and Tobago. That is to say, the Corporate Communications Unit led by Ms. Sandra Ganes. Janel Peters and others, as well as the TLIS uh, unit led by Lyle uh, Waldron and um, Onva Lewis. They have provided us with tremendous support. I wish to thank the role of the translator services in assisting us to get an outreach to Latin America uh, so that we have broadened and unwidened our, our reach. And what was the objective of today's webinar? To create awareness, to educate, to inform, and to share knowledge and information on this whole issue of decarbonization and alternative renewable energies. I think uh, to a large extent, we have achieved that objective today. I also wish to thank uh, the Port Authority of Trinidad and Tobago uh, for giving us their support without which uh, we would not have been able to uh, provide the translator services and so on here today. Um, to the participants, um, Dr. Anas Alamouche, um, Dr. Jan Hoffman, Dr. Gordon Wilmsmeyer, Dr. Dominique Englert, uh, to the host of today's uh, webinar, Stefan Nanan, and all of the background people who I know you have around you at the Center for Maritime Studies uh, Assistant. I wish to express our greatest uh, gratitude, uh, our deepest gratitude uh, for your coming out and participated and sharing your expertise uh, with us this morning. We have not covered everything. And certainly this has to be an educational series that will go forward. But um, I am happy that I was able to tap into your expertise today and, and pull this together in such a way that we have gone one step further. And um, as I said, uh, Dominic, I'm sure our chairman is going to be talking further with you with really in relation to World Bank uh, facilities um, with our own methanol and ammonia plants here in Trinidad. We are a world producer of ammonia and methanol. And indeed, LNG is a feedstock that we use to power up the um, industrial estate at Point Lisas uh, in the mid and downstream petrochemical sector. So again, guys, and to those of you who attended today's conference, uh, I wish to thank you deeply for taking the time from your very busy schedules. As Stefan said, quite a number of ministries and other state agencies and the Port Authority and Libdeco and others, and too numerous to mention, the National Energy Cooperation and its representatives and so on, uh, who have benefited from today's uh, proceedings. I wish you all the very best. I hope that you read the materials that have been put out on the chat, the links, 
and to educate and further inform yourself and to continue to participate. Look out for further ventures from the University of Trinidad and Tobago as we walk this road towards decarbonization and the use of alternative renewable energies. Thank you very much again, Professor Clement Imbe, Chairman of the University of Trinidad and Tobago for your kind support and guidance. Uh, good day uh, and have an enjoyable rest of the day, guys. Good night. Pleasure. Thank you, Thank you so day, much. Everyone. Wonderful day. Bye-bye. Thank you. Thank you. Bye -bye. Thank you. Have a great day. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, thank you all.